The Poem of the Man God, The Second Year of the Public Life. Chapter 170, The Sermon of the Mount, The Beatitudes, Part 1. 24th of May, 1945. Jesus speaks to the apostles, allotting a place to each one so that they may direct and watch over the crowd who are climbing up the mountain since the early hours in the morning, with sick people whom they carry in their arms, or in stretchers, or who have dragged themselves along on crutches. Among the people there are Stephen and Hermas. The air is clear and rather chilly, but the sun soon softens the fresh mountain air, which on its turn moderates the heat of the sun drawing benefit from it, as it becomes pure and cool, but not sharp. The people sit on the stones, scattered in the little valley between the two crests, but some wait for the sun to dry the grass wet with dew, so that they may sit down on the earth. There is a huge crowd from all the districts in Palestine, and the people are of all conditions. The apostles disappear in the multitude. But like bees that come and go from the meadows to the beehives, now and again they go back to the master to inform him, to ask for advice, and for the pleasure of being seen near him. Jesus climbs a little higher up than the meadow, which is at the bottom of the little valley. He leans against the rock and begins speaking. Many have asked me, during a year of preaching. You say that you are the Son of God. Tell us what is heaven, what is the kingdom, what is God. Because our notions are hazy. We know that there is a heaven with God and the angels, but no one has ever come to tell us what it is like, because it is closed to righteous people. They have also asked me, what the kingdom is and what God is. And I have endeavoured to explain to you what the kingdom is and what God is. I have striven not because it was difficult for me to give an explanation, but because it is difficult for many reasons to get you to accept the truth that clashes as far as the kingdom is concerned with a multitude of ideas which have risen over the centuries. And as far as God is concerned, with the sublimity of his nature. Others have also asked me, all right, that is the kingdom and that is God, but how do we achieve them? Here again, I have tried to explain to you patiently the true spirit of the law of Sinai, who abides by that spirit, conquers heaven, but to explain the law of Sinai to you, it is necessary to make you hear the loud thunder of the lawgiver and of his prophet, who, while promising blessing to obedient believers, threaten terrible punishments and maledictions to those who disobey. The epiphany of Sinai was frightful, and this dreadfulness is reflected in the entire law and has been reflected throughout centuries and in all souls. But God is not only a legislator. God is a father, and a father of immense goodness. Probably, nay, certainly, your souls are not in a position to rise and contemplate the infinite perfections of God and his goodness, least of all because goodness and love are the rarest virtues among men. The reason is that your souls are weakened by original sin, by passions, by your own sins, by your own selfishness and the selfishness of other people. The former closes your souls, the latter irritates them. Goodness, how sweet it is to be good, without hatred, without envy, without pride. 
How sweet it is to have eyes that look only for love and hands that stretch out only in gestures of love and lips that utter only words of love and a heart, above all a heart, that full only of love urges eyes, hands and lips to acts of love. The most learned amongst you know with which gifts God had enriched Adam, both for himself and for his descendants. Also the most ignorant amongst the children of Israel know that there is a soul in us. Only the poor heathens are unaware of this royal guest, of this vital breath and celestial light that sanctifies and gives life to our body. But the most learned know which gifts were given to man and to the soul of man. God was not less munificent to the soul than to the flesh and blood of the creature made by him with a little mud and his breath. As he gave the natural gifts of beauty and integrity, of intelligence and willpower, and the capability of loving oneself and other people, he also gave moral gifts and the subjection of senses to reason. Therefore, the wicked capacity of senses and passions did not permeate the freedom and control of Adam and of his will, with which God had gifted him. Thus he was free to love, free to wish, free to enjoy injustice, without what makes you slave causing you to feel the bite of the poison that Satan spread and which now overflows, carrying you out of the limpid riverbed onto the slimy fields and putrescent ponds where the fever of carnal and moral senses fermentates. You must realise that also the concupiscence of thought is sensual. But they received supernatural gifts, that is, sanctifying grace, a heavenly destiny, the vision of God. Sanctifying grace, the life of the soul, the most spiritual thing deposited in our spiritual soul. The grace that makes us children of God because it preserves us from the death of sin. And who is not dead lives in the house of the Father, Paradise, in my kingdom, heaven. What is this grace that sanctifies and gives life and kingdom? Oh, not many words are required. Grace is love. Grace is therefore God. It is God admiring himself in the creature whom he created perfect. He loves himself contemplates himself, desires himself, gives himself what is his own to multiply it, to delight in the multiplication, to love himself in many others who are others, himself. O oh, my children, do not defraud God of this right of his. Do not deprive God of what belongs to him. Do not disappoint God in his desire. Consider that he acts out of love. Even if you did not exist, he would still be infinite. And his power would not diminish. But he, although he is complete in his infinite, immeasurable measure, does not want anything for himself and in himself, which he could not, because he's already infinite. But he wants everything for his creation. For his creature. He wants to increase his love for all rational creatures contained in creation and therefore gives you his grace. Love that you may carry it in yourselves to the perfection of saints and you may pour this treasure taken from the treasure that God has given you with his grace and increased by all the holy deeds 
in all your heroic lives of saints into the infinite ocean where God is, into heaven. You are divine reservoirs of love. That is what you are. And no death is given to your being because you are eternal as God is, being like God. You shall be, and there will be no end to your being, because you are immortal like the Holy Spirits that supernourished you, returning to you, enriched by their own merits. You live and nourish, you live and enrich, you live and form the most holy thing, which is the communion of the Spirits. From God, the most perfect spirit, down to the last-born baby who sucks his mother's breast for the first time. Do not criticize me in your heart, so learned men. Do not say, he is crazy, he is a liar, because he speaks foolishly, saying that there is grace in us, when sin has deprived us of it. He lies, stating that we are already one thing with God. Yes, there is sin, and there is separation. But before the power of the Redeemer, sin, the cruel separation between the father and the children, will collapse like a wall shaken by a new Samson. I have already got hold of it, and I am shaking it. And it is about to fall, and Satan is trembling with wrath and impotence, as he can avail nothing against my power. And he realizes that so much prey is being snatched from him, and that it is becoming more difficult to drag man to sin. Because when I will have taken you to my father through me, and you have been cleansed and strengthened by my blood and sorrow. Grace will come back to you, lively and powerful, and you will be triumphant if you so wish. God does no violence to your thoughts or your sanctification. You are free. But he gives you back your strength. He gives you back your freedom from Satan's empire. It is up to you to take upon yourselves the infernal yoke or to put angelical wings on your souls. It depends on you, with me as your brother to guide you and nourish you with an immortal food. You may ask, how can one conquer God and his kingdom through a milder road than the harsh Sinai one? There is no other road but that one. But let us look at it not from the point of view of a threat, but from a point of view of love. Let us not say, woe to me if I do not do that, trembling with fear of sinning, of not being able not to sin. But, let us say, how glad I will be if I do that. And with the impulse of a supernatural joy, full of happiness, let us rush towards these beatitudes, brought about by compliance with the law, as roses sprout from a thorny bush. How happy I will be if I am poor in spirit because mine shall be the kingdom of heaven. How happy I will be if I am gentle, because I shall have the earth for my heritage. How happy I will be if I mourn without rebelling, because I will be comforted. How happy I will be if I hunger and thirst for justice more than I do for bread and wine to satisfy the flesh because justice will satisfy me. How happy I will be if I am merciful, because I will have divine mercy shown to me. How happy I will be if I am pure in heart, 
because God will bend over my pure heart and I will see him. How happy I will be if I am peaceful in spirit, because God will call me his son, because love is in peace and God is love who loves whoever is like him. How happy I will be if I am persecuted in the cause of right, because God my Father, to reward me for my earthly persecutions, will give me the kingdom of heaven. How happy I will be if I am abused and accused falsely for being your son. Oh God, it must not cause me desolation but joy, as it will make me equal to your best servants to the prophets who were persecuted for the same reason and with whom I firmly believe I shall share the same great eternal reward in heaven which is mine. Let us look thus at the way of salvation through the joy of saints. How happy I will be if I am poor in spirit. Oh, satanic thirst for wealth, to what frenzy you lead both rich and poor. The rich who live for their gold, the ill-famed idol of their ruined spirits. The poor who live hating the rich because of their gold. And even if they do not murder them physically, they curse the rich, wishing them all sorts of evil. It is not enough not to do evil. One must not even wish to do it. He who curses, wishing calamities and death, is very like him who kills physically, because he wishes the death of the person he hates. I solemnly tell you that such a wish is like an action held back. It is like a fetus conceived in a womb and formed, but not yet ejected. A wicked desire corrupts and ruins a man because it lasts longer than a violent action and is deeper than the action itself. If a rich man is poor in spirit, he does not sin for the sake of his gold, but he turns his gold into sanctification because he turns it into love. Loved and blessed, he is like spring water that saves travellers in a desert as he gives generously, without avarice, happy to be able to relieve desperate situations. If he is poor, he is happy in his poverty, and eats his bread which is sweetened by the joy of being free from the thirst of gold. He sleeps free from nightmares and gets up well rested for his tranquil work, which is always light when done without greed or envy. What makes man materially rich is gold. What makes him morally rich are his affections. Gold comprises not only money, but also houses, fields, jewels, furniture, herds, everything, in other words, that which makes life wealthy materially. Affections include blood or marriage ties, friendship, intellectual soundness, public offices, etc. As you can see, if for the first group a poor man can say, Oh, as far as I am concerned, providing I do not envy those who are rich, I am all right because I am poor, and thus I am settled by force of circumstances. With regard to the second group, also a poor man must be careful, because also the poorest man can become sinfully rich in spirit. He who is immoderately attached to a thing, commits a sin. You may say, are we then to hate the wealth that God granted us? 
Why then does he command us to love our fathers, mothers, wives, children, and say, you shall love your neighbors as yourself? Now you must distinguish. We must love our fathers, mothers, wives, and our neighbor, but in the degree indicated by God as ourselves. Whereas God, is to be loved above everything and with our whole selves. We must not love God as we love the dearest people among our neighbours. Because a woman suckled us, or because she sleeps on our chest and procreates children for us. But we must love him with our whole selves. That is, with all the ability to love that is in man the love of a son, of a husband, of a friend, and do not be scandalized, the love of a father. Yes, we must have for the interests of God the same care that a father has for his children, for whom he lovingly protects his wealth and increases it, and he takes care of it and is anxious for their physical growth and intellectual education, and for their success in the world. Love is not an evil, and must not become an evil. The graces which God grants us are not evil, and must not become so. They are love, granted out of love. We must make a loving use of such wealth granted to us by God in personal affections, and in worldly goods. And only he who does not make an idol of such wealth, but uses it to serve God in holiness, shows that he has no sinful attachment to it. One then practices that holy poverty in spirit that deprives itself of everything in order to be more free to conquer God, the holy supreme. To conquer God, that is, to have the kingdom of heaven. How happy I will be if I am gentle. This may seem to be in contrast with the facts of daily life. Those who are not lowly seem to be prominent and successful in their families, towns and countries. But is theirs a real triumph? No, it is not. It is fear that keeps apparently subdued those who are overwhelmed by the despot. But in actual fact, it is nothing but a veil drawn over the rebellion, seething against the tyrant. Irascible and overbearing people do not win the love of their relatives, of their own citizens, or of their subjects. Neither are intellects or souls convinced to follow the doctrines of masters who impose themselves by stating, I said so, thus it is. Such masters only create self-taught men, seeking the key that can open the closed doors of a wisdom or of a science which they feel to be and actually is the opposite of what is imposed on them. Those priests who do not endeavour to conquer souls by means of a patient, humble and loving kindness do not win any souls to God. But they look like armed warriors who start a fierce attack. Such is their intolerant rashness in dealing with souls. Oh, poor souls! If they were holy... They would not need you, O oh priests, to reach the light. They would already have it within themselves. If they were just, they would not need you, O oh judges, to be put under the restraint of justice, as they would already have justice within themselves. If they were healthy, they would not need a doctor. Be, therefore, gentle. Do not put souls to flight. Attract them through love. 
because loneliness is love, as poverty in spirit is love. If you are such, you will have the earth for your heritage, and you will take this place to God, whereas before it belonged to Satan, because your loneliness, which besides love is also humility, will have overcome hatred and pride, expelling from souls the vile king of hatred and pride. And the world will belong to you, that is, to God, because you will be the just souls that will acknowledge God as the absolute master of creation, to whom praise and blessing are due, and everything else which belongs to him. How happy I will be if I mourn without rebelling. Sorrow is on the earth and sorrow wrings tears from men. Sorrow did not exist, but man brought it onto the earth. And because of his corrupt intellect, he continuously strives to increase it in every possible way. Besides diseases and calamities, Ensuing from thunderbolts, storms, avalanches, earthquakes. Man suffer. And above all, to make other people suffer. Because we would like only other people to suffer and not ourselves. The effects of means studied to make people suffer. Man invents deadly weapons, which are more and more dreadful and Moral hardships, which are more and more cunning. How many tears man wrings from his fellow man through the instigation of his secret king, Satan. But I solemnly tell you that those tears are not an impairment, but a perfection of man. Man is an absent-minded child a thoughtless, superficial child, a backward-born child until tears make him an adult, thoughtful, intelligent person. Only those who weep or have wept know how to love and can understand. They know how to love their weeping brothers, how to understand them in their grief, how to help them with their goodness, which is fully aware how bitter it is to weep alone. And they know how to love God, because they have realised that everything is grief except God, because they have understood that sorrow can be soothed if tears are shed on God's heart. And they have also realised that resigned tears which do not cause faith to be lost or prayers to become barren, and which loathe rebellion. Such resigned tears change nature, and instead of sorrow, they become comfort. Yes, those who weep loving the Lord will be comforted. How happy I will be if I hunger and thirst for justice. From the moment he is born to the moment he dies, man craves eagerly for food. He opens his mouth at his birth to get hold of his mother's nipple. He opens his lips to swallow some refreshment in the throes of death. He works to feed himself. He makes a huge nipple of the world from which he sucks insatiably for that which is perishable. But what is man? An animal? No, he is a son of God. He is in exile for a few or many years. But his life does not come to an end when he changes his dwelling. There is a life in life as there is a kernel in a nut. The shell is not the nut, 
but it is the kernel inside the shell that is the nut. If you sow a shell, nothing will come up. But if you sow the shell with the kernel inside it, a big tree will grow. The same applies to man. It is not his flesh that becomes immortal, but his soul. And it is to be nourished, to take it to immortality, to which the soul, out of love, will take the body in the blessed resurrection. Wisdom and justice are the nourishment of the soul. They are taken as food and as drink, and they strengthen, and the more one takes of them, the more grows the holy eagerness to possess wisdom and know justice. But the day will come when the holy, insatiable hunger of the soul will be satisfied. It will come. God will give himself to his child and will suckle him, and the child destined for paradise will be satisfied with the admirable mother who is God himself. And man will never be hungry again, but will rest happily on God's divine bosom. No human science is equal to this divine science. The curiosity of the mind can be gratified, but the necessities of the spirit cannot. Nay, the spirit is disgusted by the difference in taste and makes a wry mouth at the bitter nipple, preferring to suffer the pangs of hunger rather than be filled with a food that does not come from God. Be not afraid, O men, thirsting or starving for God. Be faithful, and you will be satisfied by him who loves you. How happy I will be if I am merciful. Who amongst men can say I do not need mercy? No one. Now, if in the old law it is written, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, why should we not say in the new law, who has been merciful shall find mercy? Everybody needs forgiveness. Well then, forgiveness is not achieved by formulae or by the form of a rite, which are external symbols granted to man's dull mentality. It is instead obtained through the internal right of love, which is still mercy. If the sacrifice of a goat or a lamb and the offer of a few coins were prescribed, the reason is that every evil is founded on two roots, greed and pride. Greed is punished through the expense for the purchase of the offering. Pride by the open confession of the right. I am making this sacrifice because I have sinned. It is also done to anticipate the times and the signs of the times, and in the blood which is shed is symbolized the blood which will be shed to cancel the sins of men. Blessed, therefore, are those who are merciful to those who are hungry Nude, homeless, to those who suffer from the greatest misery, which is to have a bad disposition, as it causes grief both to those who have it and to those who live with them. Be merciful, forgive, bear with people, help them, teach them and support them. Do not conceal yourselves in a crystal tower, saying, I am pure, and I will not descend amongst sinners. Do not say, I am rich and happy, and I will not hear of other people's miseries. Remember that your richness, your health, your family wealth may vanish quicker than smoke blown away by a strong wind. 
And remember, that crystal acts as a lens, and consequently, what may be unnoticed if you were mixed among the crowds cannot be concealed if you place yourselves in a crystal tower where you are alone, isolated, and illuminated on all sides. Mercy is necessary to offer a continuous, secret, holy sacrifice of expiation and to obtain mercy. How happy I will be if I am pure in heart. God is purity. Paradise is the kingdom of purity. Nothing impure can enter paradise where God is. Therefore, if you are impure, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. Oh, but what a joy the Father grants to his children in advance, who is pure, has in this world an advance of heaven, because God bends over a pure soul. And man from the earth can see his God. He is not familiar with the taste of human love, but relishes the flavour of divine love to the point of being enraptured and can say, I am with you and you are in me. I therefore possess you and I recognise you as the most loving spouse of my soul. And believe me, who has God enjoys substantial changes of which he himself is unaware and thus becomes holy, wise and strong. Words embellish his lips and his actions acquire a strength that is not of the creature but comes from God who lives in it. What is the life of those who see God? A beatitude. And do you wish to deprive yourselves of such a gift for the sake of fetid impurities? How happy I will be if I am peaceful in spirit. Peace is one of God's characteristics. God is to be found only in peace. Because peace is love, whereas war is hatred, Satan is hatred. God is peace. No man can say that he is the son of God. Neither can God call son, a man who has an irascible soul, always ready to stir up a storm. Not only, neither can he be called the son of God, who, although not a troublemaker himself, by means of his own great peace, does not help to calm the storms stirred up by other people. Who is peaceful propagates peace, also without uttering any words. Master of himself, and I dare say, master of God, he divulges him as a lamp spreads its light, as a thurible exhales its perfume, as a wineskin holds wine, and the sweet oil which is the spirit of peace issuing from the children of God gives light in the foggy gloominess of ill feelings and purifies the air from the miasmas of malice and calms the raging waves of quarrels. Let God and men say that you are so. How happy I will be if I am persecuted in the cause of right. Man has become so devilish that he hates good wherever it is, and he hates who is good, as if who is good, even when silent, accuses and reproaches him. In fact, the goodness of one person makes the wickedness of a wicked person appear even more wicked. In fact, the faith of a true believer makes the hypocrisy of a false believer 
appear more clearly. In fact, he who by his way of living continuously bears witness to justice can but be hated by the unjust. And then the unjust are pitiless towards the lovers of justice. The same applies here as in wars. Man makes more progress in the satanic art of persecution than in the holy art of love. But he can persecute only what has a short life. What is eternal in man eludes the snare. Nay, it achieves a more energetic vitality than persecution itself. Life escapes through the bleeding wounds or because of the privations that consume those who are persecuted. But the blood makes the purple of the future king and the privations are as many steps to ascend the thrones that the father has prepared for his martyrs for whom are reserved the royal seats in the kingdom of heaven. How happy I will be if I am accused and abused falsely. Strive to have your names written in the celestial books, where names are not written according to human falsehood which is accustomed to praise those who less deserve praise, where instead with justice and love are written the deeds of good people in order to give them the reward promised to the blessed ones by God. In the past, the prophets were calumniated and abused, but when the gates of heaven are opened, they will enter the city of God like imposing kings and the angels will bow singing out of joy. You too, who have been abused and accused falsely for being the children of God, will have a heavenly triumph. And when the time comes to an end and paradise is full, then every tear will be dear to you because through it, you will have conquered the eternal glory which I promise you in the name of the Father. Go. I will speak to you again tomorrow. Only the sick people should remain that I may relieve them from their pains. Peace be with you and may the meditation on salvation lead you through love on the road, the end of which is heaven. The Poem of the Man-God, The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 171 The Sermon of the Mount The Beatitudes Part 2 25th of May, 1945 The Sermon of the Mount continues It is the same place and the same time. The crowd is larger. In a corner, near a path, there is a Roman who seems anxious to hear but does not want to upset the crowd. I recognise him from his short tunic and the different style of his mantle. Stephen and Hermas are still there. Jesus walks slowly to his place and resumes speaking. What I told you yesterday must not cause you to think that I have come to abolish the law. No, but since I am the man, and I understand the weakness of man, I wanted to encourage you to comply with it, turning your spiritual eyes not to the dark abyss, but to the bright sublimity. Because if the fear of punishment can hold you back three times out of ten, the certainty of a reward will urge you seven times out of ten. Trust is therefore more efficacious than fear. And I want you to be fully and firmly confident so that you accomplish 
not seven parts of good out of ten, but ten out of ten, and thus gain the most holy prize of heaven. I will not change one iota of the law. And who gave it amongst the peals of thunder on Sinai? The Most High. Who is the Most High? God one and trine. Where did he take it from? From his thought. How did he give it? By his word. Why did he give it? Out of his love. You can thus see that the Trinity was present, and the Word, obedient as ever to the thought and love, spoke on behalf of the thought and love. Could I give myself the lie? No, I could not. But since I can do everything, I can complete the law, make it divinely complete, not what men did throughout centuries, as they did not make it complete, but incomprehensible and impossible to be fulfilled. In fact, they superimposed precepts and laws taken from their own thoughts, according to their own gain, and they thus lapidated and suffocated, sterilized and buried the most holy law given by God. Can a tree survive if it is continuously struck by avalanches, rubble and floods? No, it will die. The law dies in many hearts, suffocated by the avalanches of too many superstructures. I have come to remove them all. And after unearthing and reviving the law, I will make it no longer a law, but a queen. Queens promulgate laws. The laws are the work of queens, but they are not above queens. I instead make the law a queen. I complete it. I crown it, putting on its top the wreath of the evangelic councils. Before, it was order. Now, it is more than order. Before, it was the necessary thing. Now, it is more than the necessary thing. Now, it is perfection. Who weds it, as I present you with it, becomes immediately a king, because he has reached perfection because he has been not only obedient, but also heroic, that is holy, as holiness is the sum of virtues carried to the greatest height attainable by a creature, heroically loved and practised through a complete detachment from every human desire and consideration. I could say that he is a saint whom love and desire Prevent from seeing everything but God. As his attention is not distracted by inferior sights, his eyes and heart are fixed on the most holy brightness, which is God, and in which, since everything is in God, he can see his distressed brothers stretching out their hands suppliantly. And without taking his eyes away from God, the saint devotes himself to his suppliant brothers against the flesh, against wealth, against comfort. He pursues his ideal to serve. Is a saint poor or disabled? No, he is not. He has succeeded in achieving true wisdom and wealth. He therefore possesses everything, and he never tires, because while it is true that he is always active, it is also true that he is continuously nourished. 
And while he understands the sorrows of the world, he feeds on the delights of heaven. He is nourished by God and delights in God. He is a creature who has understood the meaning of life. As you can see, I neither change nor mutilate the law, neither do I corrupt it by superimposing human fomenting theories. I complete it. The law is what it is and shall be such until the last day. Not one word will be changed. Not one precept will be abolished. It is crowned with perfection. To reach salvation, it is sufficient to accept it as it was given. To obtain immediate union with God, it is necessary to live it according to my advice. But since heroes are an exception, I will speak to common souls, to the mass of souls, so that no one may say that I have made what is necessary unknown in order to reach perfection. But of everything I tell you, remember this. He who takes the liberty of infringing one of the least of these commandments will be considered one of the least in the kingdom of heaven. And he who will induce others to infringe them will be considered one of the least, both with regard to himself and led to infringement. He, instead, who through his life and deeds, rather than by words, has convinced others to abide by the law, will be great in the kingdom of heaven and his greatness will be increased by each of those whom he has led to obey and thus sanctify themselves. I know that what I am about to say will taste bitter to many tongues, but I cannot tell lies, even if the truth I am about to speak will procure me many enemies. I solemnly tell you that unless you create anew your justice, detaching it completely from the poor and unfairly defined justice which the Pharisees and scribes have taught you, unless you are really more just than the Pharisees and scribes who think they are just because they increase the number of formulae, without any substantial change of their spirits, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Beware of false prophets and erring doctors. They come to you clad as lambs, and they are rapacious wolves. They come clad with holiness, and they deride God. They say they love the truth, and they feed on falsehood. Study them before following them. Man has a tongue and speaks with it. He has eyes and sees with them. He has hands and makes signs with them. But he has something else which is a more truthful witness of his real being, his deed. And what are two hands joined in prayer if a man is a thief and fornicator? And what are two eyes which pretending to be inspired roll in all directions if after the farce they greedily stare at a woman or an enemy out of lust or for murder? And what is a tongue expert in whistling a false song of praise and in seducing by means of honeyed words if behind your back it calumniates you 
and is capable of swearing falsely. If only it could pass you off as a mean fellow. What is a tongue that says long hypocritical prayers and is then quick in killing the reputation of a neighbor or seducing his good faith? It is disgusting. And disgusting are untruthful hands and eyes. But the deeds of men, the true deeds, that is his behavior at home, in business, toward his neighbor and servants, are the things that testify. This man is a servant of the Lord. Because holy deeds are the fruit of true religion. A good tree does not bear bad fruit, and a bad tree does not bear good fruit. Will these thorny bushes ever be able to give you tasty grapes, and those even more stinging thistles? Will they ever be able to mature sweet figs for you? No, they will not. In actual fact, you will be able to pick only a few sour blackberries from the former, and uneatable fruits will come from the latter, which although flowers are still thorny. The man who is not just will be able to command respect by his appearance and only by it. Also, the downy thistle looks like a tuft of thin silvery threads adorned with diamonds by the view. But if inadvertently you touch it, you find out that it is not a tuft, but a bundle of thorns painful to man, harmful to sheep, so that shepherds uproot them from their pastures and burn them on the fire they light at night so that not even the seed may be spread. A just and provident step. I do not say to you, kill the false prophets and hypocritical believers. Nay, I say to you, leave the task to God. But I say to you, be careful, keep away from them, that you may not be poisoned by their juices. I told you yesterday how God is to be loved. I will insist on how our neighbours are to be loved today. Once it was said, you shall love your friend and hate your enemy. No, not so. That was all right for the times when man did not have the comfort of God's smile. But now new things have come. When God has loved man so much as to send his word to redeem him, now the word is speaking, and it is already an effusion of grace. Later, the word will consummate the sacrifice of peace and redemption, and there will be not only an effusion of grace, but grace will be given to every soul believing in Christ. It is therefore necessary to elevate the love for our neighbour to a perfection that unifies friends and enemy. Have you been slandered? Love and forgive. Have you been struck? Love and offer the other cheek to him who smacked you, considering that it is better that he gives vent to his wrath on you, 
who can put up with it, rather than on somebody else who will take vengeance for the insult. Have you been robbed? Do not think this neighbor of mine is greedy, but charitably say, this poor brother of mine is needy, and give him also your tunic if he has stolen your mantle. You will make it impossible for him to steal twice, because he will have no need to rob another person of his tunic. You may say, it may be a vice and not a need. Well, give just the same. God will reward you for it, and the wicked man will pay for it. But many times, and this should remind you of what I told you yesterday on loneliness, when he sees how he has been dealt with, his vice will drop from his heart and the sinner will redeem himself, making amends for the theft by handing back what he had stolen. Be generous towards those who, being more honest, ask you for what they need instead of robbing you. If the rich were really poor in spirit, as I explained yesterday, there would be no painful social inequalities, the cause of so many human and superhuman calamities. Always consider, if I were in need, how would I feel if I were denied help? And act according to the reply of your ego. Do to others what you would like done to yourself. And do not do to others what you would not like done to yourself. The old saying, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, which is not one of the Ten Commandments, but was added because man, devoid of grace, is such a beast that he only understands vengeance. The old saying has been cancelled. It has indeed been cancelled by the new word. Love him who hates you. Pray for him who persecutes you. Justify him who slanders you. Bless him who curses you. Help the one who harms you. Be pacific with quarrelsome people. Be compliant with bothersome persons. Willingly. Help those who have recourse to you without practicing usury. Do not criticize. Do not judge. You do not know the particular reason for men's actions. Be generous and merciful in all kinds of assistance. The more you give, the more you will be given and a full pressed-down measure will be poured by God onto the lap of him who has been generous. God will not give you only according to what you have given, but he will give you much, much more. Endeavour to love and be loved. Quarrels are more costly than friendly settlements, and a good grace it's like honey, the flavour of which lasts for a long time on one's tongue. Love, love, love friends and enemies to be like your father, who allows the rain to fall on the good and the wicked, and lest the sun shine on the just and unjust, and will grant eternal sunshine and dew, and hellish fire and hail, when the good will be chosen, like the selected ears of corn, amongst the sheaves of the harvest. It is not enough to love those who love you, and 
from whom you expect reciprocation. That is no merit. It is a joy, and also naturally honest men can do it. Also the publicans and the Gentiles do it. But you must love according to God, and out of respect for God, who is the creator also of those who are your enemies, or are not very fond of you. I want the perfection of love in you, and I therefore say, Be perfect as your Father, who is in heaven, is perfect. So great is the precept of love for your neighbour, the perfecting of the precept of love for your neighbour, that I no longer say, as it was said, do not kill, because he who kills will be condemned by men. But I say to you, do not get angry, because a higher judgment is above you and takes into account immaterial actions. Who insults his brother will be condemned by the Sanhedrin, but who treats him as a madman and consequently has harmed him will be condemned by God. It is useless to make offers at the altar unless you, for the sake of God, first sacrifice your ill feelings in your hearts and you fulfill the most holy rite of forgiveness. Therefore, when you are about to make an offering to God and you remember that you have wronged your brother and you bear him a grudge, because of a fault of his. Leave your offer before the altar. Make first the sacrifice of your self-esteem by becoming reconciled to your brother. Then come to the altar, and only then your sacrifice will be holy. Full agreement is always the best business. The judgment of man is precarious, and who stubbornly challenges it may lose the cause and have to pay the opponent down to the last coin or languish in jail. In everything, turn your eyes to God. Ask yourselves, am I entitled to do what God does not do to me? because God is not so stubborn and implacable as you are. Woe to you if he were. No one would be saved. Let that consideration induce you to mild, humble, pitiful feeling. And then you will certainly receive a reward from God, both here and in the next world. Here in front of me, there is also one who hates me and dare not say to me, cure me, because he knows that I am aware of his thoughts. But I say, let it be done as you wish. And as the scales fall from your eyes, so may ill feelings and darkness fall from your heart. You may all go with my peace. I will speak to you again tomorrow. The crowds disperse slowly, waiting perhaps for the cry of a miracle, which, however, is not heard. Also the apostles and the first disciples who remain on the mountain ask, Who was it? Has he not been cured? And they insist with the master, who is standing with folded arms, watching the crowd descending the mountain. Jesus at first does not reply. He then says, His eyes are cured, but his soul is not. 
it cannot be cured because it is full of hatred. But who is it? That Roman, perhaps? No, a poor wretch. Why did you cure him then? asks Peter. Should I strike by lightning all the people like him? Lord, I know that you do not want me to say yes, and so I will not say it, but that is what I think, and it is the same. It is the same, Simon of Jonah. You should know then. Oh, how many hearts covered with scales of hatred there are around me. Come, let us go up there to the top to look from the height at our beautiful Sea of Galilee. Only you and I. The Poem of the Man God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 172 The Sermon of the Mount The Beatitudes Part 3 26th of May, 1945 the Sermon of the Mount continues. The same place and the same time. The people, with the exception of the Roman, are the same. Perhaps the crowd is larger, because many people are standing at the beginning of the paths leading to the little valley. Jesus is speaking. One of the errors easily made by man is to have lack of honesty towards himself. And since man is rarely sincere and honest, he has made some provision for himself in order to be compelled to go along the way he wants. This curb, which after all, as he is a fiery horse, he soon slackens or gives a pull, as he wishes and thus changes his gait. Or he removes it completely and does as he likes, without considering what reproach he may receive from God, from men, and from his own conscience. That bit is the oath. But no oath is necessary amongst honest people, and God never taught you it. On the contrary, he commanded you, you shall not bear false witness without any further addition. Because man ought to be frank without the need of anything except the loyalty of his word. When in Deuteronomy, mention is made of vows, also of the vows that are something which originated from a heart considered to be united to God, either through a feeling of need or a sentiment of gratitude, it is written, Whatever passes your lips, you must keep to. And the vow that you have freely made with your own mouth to the Lord your God must be fulfilled. Mention is always made of the word given without anything else but the word. Who feels the need of taking an oath is neither sure of himself nor of the option his neighbour has of him. And who makes other people take an oath testifies thereby that he distrusts the frankness and honesty of the swearer. As you can see, the habit of taking an oath is one of the consequences of man's moral dishonesty. And it is a shame for man. It is a double shame because man is not even faithful to the shameful thing which an oath is. And by deriding God as easily as he derides his neighbour, he swears falsely 
with the greatest ease and calmness. Can there be a more contemptible man than a pajora? A pajora, in fact, convinces his neighbor to believe him, often by using a sacred formula, thus calling God to be his accomplice and to stand surety for him or by invoking his dearest affections, his father, mother, wife, children, his dead relatives, his very life and most essential organs to support his false statement. He thus deceives his neighbor. He is an impious person, a thief, a traitor, a murderer. Of whom? Of God, of course. Because he contaminates the truth with his disgraceful lies and jeers at him, daring him. Strike me. Give me the lie if you can. You are there. I am here. And I laugh at it. Of course, you may laugh. Liars and jibers, but the moment will come when you will not laugh, and that will happen when he, to whom all power is entrusted, will appear to you, dreadful in his majesty, and simply by his aspect will make you stand to attention, and will strike you with the lightning of his eyes, before his voice hurls you to your eternal destiny branding you with his curse. He is a thief because he takes possession of a reputation which he does not deserve. His neighbor, impressed by his oath, grants it to him, and the serpent adorns himself with it, pretending to be what he is not. He is a traitor, because by his oath he promises something which he does not want to keep. He is a murderer. He kills either the honor of his fellow man, depriving him of his reputation through false witness, or he kills his own soul, because a perjurer is a vile sinner in the eyes of God who sees the truth also when no one else sees it. God cannot be deceived, neither by means of false words, nor by means of a hypocritical deed. He sees. He does not lose sight of each man for a moment. And there is no fortified stronghold or deep cellar, which his eyes cannot penetrate. Also within you, God penetrates the stronghold which every man has round his heart. And he judges you, not according to what you swear, but to what you do. I will therefore substitute another order for the one given to you. When the oath enjoyed great favor to put a restraint on lies and on the easiness of failure to keep a promise. I do not say as the ancients said, do not swear falsely, but keep your oath. But I say to you, never swear. Neither by heaven, which is the throne of God, nor by the earth, which is the stool of his feet, nor for Jerusalem and her temple, which are the city of the great king and the house of the Lord our God. Do not swear either by the graves of the deceased or by their souls. 
graves are full of the dross of the inferior part of man, which is common also to animals. And with regard to their souls, leave them in their dwellings. Do not cause them to suffer or to be struck with horror. If they are the souls of just people, already in the foreknowledge of God. And although they are in such foreknowledge, which is partial knowledge, because they will not possess God in the fullness of his brightness until the moment of redemption, they can but suffer seeing you sinners. And if they are not just, do not increase their torture by reminding them of their sin through yours. Leave the holy deceased in their peace and the unholy ones in their pains. Do not deprive the former of anything. Do not add anything to the latter. Why appeal to the dead? They cannot speak. The saints because charity prevents them from speaking. They would have to give you the lie too many times. The damned, because hell does not open its gates, and the damned only open their mouths to curse, and their voices are suffocated by the hatred of Satan and of the demons, because the damned are like demons. Do not swear by the head of your father or of your mother or by the head of your wife or of your innocent children. You have no right to do so. Are they perhaps money or merchandise? Are they a signature on a document? They are more and they are less than such things. They are blood and flesh of your own blood, man. But they are also free creatures, and you cannot use them as slaves to guarantee your false statement. And they are less than your signature, because you are intelligent, free, and grown up. You are not interdicted. Neither are you a child who does not know what he is doing and must be represented by his parents. You are a man gifted with reason and consequently responsible for your actions. And you must act by yourself, employing as a guarantee of your own deeds and words your own honesty and your own frankness, the reputation that you enjoy with your neighbour, not the honesty, the frankness of your relatives and the reputation they enjoy. Are fathers responsible for their children? Yes, they are. But only as long as they are under age. After Everybody is responsible for himself. Not always just children are born of just parents. Nor is it so that a holy woman is married to a holy man. Why, then, use the justice of a relative as a guarantee? Likewise, holy children may be born of a sinner. And as long as they are innocent, they are holy. Why then appeal to a pure soul for an impure act of yours, such as an oath which you wish to swear falsely? Do not swear by your own head, your eyes, your tongue, 
your hands. You have no right to. Everything you have belongs to God. You are only the temporary guardians, the bankers of the moral or material treasures which God granted you. Why then make use of what does not belong to you? Can you add one hair to your head or change its colour? And if you cannot do that, why do you use your sight? your word, the freedom of your limbs to corroborate your oath. Do not challenge God. He could take you at your word and dry your eyes as he can dry up your orchards or take your children away from you or crush your houses to remind you that he is the Lord and you his subjects and that who idolizes himself and thinks he is above God, challenging him with his falsehood, is cursed. Let your speech be simply, yes, it is. No, it is not. Nothing else. Any addition is suggested by the evil one who later will laugh at you because you cannot remember anything and you will contradict yourself and you will be jeered at and recognised as a liar. Be sincere, my children, both in your words and in your prayers. Do not behave like hypocrites who, when praying, love to stand in synagogues or in the corners of squares where they may be seen by people and praised as just and pious men, whereas within their families they are guilty towards God and towards their neighbour. Do you not consider that that is like a form of perjury? Why do you want to maintain as true what is not true in order to win a reputation which you do not deserve? An hypocritical prayer aims at saying, I am truly a saint. I swear it in the presence of those who see me and cannot deny they saw me pray. Like a veil laid on existing wickedness, a prayer said for such purposes becomes blasphemy. Let God proclaim you saints and live in such a way that your whole life may shout on your behalf. Here is a servant of God. But you must be silent for your own sake. Do not allow your tongue to be urged by pride and thus become an object of scandal in the angel's eyes. It would be better for you to become mute at once if you do not have the power to control pride and tongue. And you proclaim yourselves just and pleasing to God. Leave that Poor glory to proud and false people. Leave that fleeting reward to haughty and deceitful people. A poor reward. But that is what they want. And they will not have any other. Because you cannot have more than one. Either the true reward, the heavenly one which is eternal and just, or the sham one, the earthly one, which lasts as long as the life of man, and even less, and which is paid for after this life with a truly mortifying punishment, because it is an unjust reward. 
Listen, how you must pray with your lips and with your work and with your whole selves, urged by your hearts, which do love God and feel he is your father, and always remember who the creator is and what the creature is. In the presence of God, they are always full of reverential love. Whether you are praying or are busy, whether you are walking or resting, earning or helping. I said, urged by your hearts. It is the first and essential feature because everything comes from your hearts and your mind. Your words, your eyes, your deeds are like your hearts. A just man draws good from his just heart. And the more he draws, the more he finds. Because the good done creates more good. Like blood that is renewed circulating in the veins and flows back to the heart enriched with new elements taken from the oxygen which it had absorbed or from the food juices which it had assimilated. Whereas a wicked man can draw but fraud and poison from his gloomy heart full of fraud and poison which grow more and more because they are corroborated by accumulating sins, while the blessings of God accumulate in a good man. You may be sure that it is the exuberance of the heart that overflows from lips and reveals itself in deeds. Make your hearts humble, pure, loving, trustful and sincere and love God with the chaste love of a virgin for her bridegroom. I solemnly tell you that each soul is a virgin married to the eternal lover, to God our Lord. This world is the time of engagement during which the guardian angel of every man is the spiritual paranymph, and all the hours and contingencies of life are as many maids preparing the nuptial trousseau. The hour of death is the hour for the accomplished wedding, when the introduction, embrace, and union take place and the soul can raise the veil of the bridal dress and throw itself into the arms of God. And the spouse will not cause scandal by loving so. But for the time being, O oh souls, still victimized in the bonds of the engagement to God, when you wish to speak to the spouse, Withdraw to the peace of your abode. Above all, to the peace of your inner abodes. And angels of flesh, helped by your guardian angels, speak to the king of angels. Speak to your father in the secrecy of your hearts and of your inner room. Leave outside everything that belongs to the world. Eagerness to be noted and to edify, and the scruples of long prayers full of words, of monotonous, tepid words lacking love. For God's sake, get rid of standards in your prayers. There are really some people who waste many hours reciting a monologue only with their lips and which is a real soliloquy because not even the guardian angels listen to it. It is such a vain noise. 
that they become absorbed in fervent prayer for the silly men guarded by them in an effort to find a remedy. There are, in fact, some men who would not spend those hours in a different way, not even if God appeared to them, saying, The salvation of the world depends on your leaving such soulless manner of speech and going, shall we say, just to draw water from a well and pour it onto the ground for my sake and the sake of your fellow men. There are indeed many who believe that their monologue is more important than the kindness in receiving a visitor or the charity in helping a person in need. They are souls which have fallen into the idolatry of prayer. Prayer is an act of love. And one can love praying or baking bread meditating or assisting a sick person, making a pilgrimage to the temple or looking after the family, sacrificing a lamb or sacrificing one's desires, even the honest desire to concentrate on the Lord. It is sufficient for you to have your whole selves and all your actions impregnated with love. Be not afraid, the Father sees, understands, listens, grants. How many graces are granted for one single, true, perfect sigh of love? How much wealth for an intimate sacrifice made with love? Do not be like the Gentiles. God does not need to be told what he has to do for your needs. The pagans may tell their idols, which cannot understand. But you cannot tell God, the true spiritual God, who is not only God and King, but also your Father and knows what you need even before you ask him. Ask, and it will be given to you. Look, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Because whoever asks will receive, whoever looks will find, and it will be opened to whomsoever knocks. When your child stretches his little hand towards you, saying, Father, I am hungry, do you perhaps give him a stone? Will you give him a snake if he asks for a fish? No, you will give him bread and fish and caresses and blessings over and above. Because it is pleasant for a father to nourish his son and see his happy smile. If therefore you, whose hearts are imperfect, are capable of giving gifts to your children, out of a natural love that is common also to animals for your offspring, how much more will your Father who is in heaven grant to those who ask him for the good and necessary things for their welfare? Do not be afraid to ask. And do not be afraid not to receive. However, I wish to warn you against an easy error. Do not behave like those who are weak in their faith and in their love. Also amongst believers, there are pagans whose poor religion is a mixture of superstition and faith a building tampered with, into which 
All kinds of parasitic herbs have penetrated. So much so that it falls to pieces. And they, weak and pagan as they are, feel their faith is dying if they are not hurt. You ask, and you think it is fair to ask. And for that particular moment, a certain grace may be right. But life does not end at that moment. And what is good today may not be good tomorrow. You do not know that, because you know only the present. And that is a grace of God, too. But God knows also the future. And God, to save you a greater pain, does not hear your prayers. During my year of public life, more than once I heard hearts moaning. How much I suffered then, when God did not hear me. But now I say, it was better thus, because that grace would have prevented me from reaching this hour of God. I heard others say to me, Why, Lord, do you not hear me? You grant it to everybody, but not to me. And yet, although I was sorry to see them suffer, I had to say, I cannot because to hear them would have meant hindering their flight to a perfect life. Also the Father sometimes says, I cannot, not because he cannot satisfy the request immediately, but because he does not want to satisfy it in view of future consequences. Listen, a child is suffering from intestinal trouble. His mother calls a doctor, and the doctor says he must fast to be cured. The mother, always pitiful, joins her moaning to her sons. She thinks that the doctor's order is severe and hard. She feels that such fasting and crying may be detrimental to her son. But the doctor is inflexible. At last, he says, Woman, I know you don't. Do you want to lose your son? Or do you want me to save him? The mother shouts, I want him to live. In that case, says the doctor. I cannot let him have any food. It would kill him. Also the father sometimes says so. You pitiful mothers of your own ego do not want to hear it weep because some grace has been denied. But God says, I cannot. It would do you harm. The day will come, or eternity will come, when you will say, thank you, my God, for not listening to my foolishness. What I said with regard to prayers, I say with regard to fasting. When you fast, do not look sad as hypocrites do, who on purpose disfigure their faces, that the world may know and believe that they are fasting, even if it is not true. They also have received their reward with the praise of the world and will not receive another one. Instead, when you fast, look happy, Wash your faces thoroughly so that they may look fresh and smooth. Put oil on your heads and scents on your hair 
and smile like one who has been well fed. Oh, truly, there is no food that nourishes as much as love does. And who fasts with a loving spirit feeds on love. I solemnly tell you that even if the world calls you vain and publicans, the Father will see your heroic secret and will give you a double reward, one for your fasting and the other for the sacrifice of not being praised for it. And now go, feed your bodies, since your souls have been nourished. Those two poor people may stay here with us. They will be blessed guests who will give flavour to our bread. Peace be with you. And the two poor people stay. One is a very lean woman, the other a very old man. They are not together. Chance had joined them, as they were standing dejected in a corner, stretching out in vain their hands towards those who pass in front of them. Jesus goes straight towards them, since they dare not come forward, and takes them by the hand, leading them to the middle of the group of the apostles, under a kind of tent that Peter has put up in a corner, and under which they perhaps take shelter at night and they gather during the hot hours of the day. It is a shed formed by branches and mantles, but it serves its purpose, although it is so low that Jesus and his chariot, the tallest of the lot, have to bend to enter. Here, a father and a sister, bring what we have. While taking our food, we will hear their story. And Jesus personally serves the two shy old souls and listens to their sorrowful stories. The man is alone after his daughter went far away with her husband and forgot her father. The woman is also alone after a fever killed her husband and in addition she is ill. The world despises us because we are poor says the old man. I wander about begging for alms to scrape together some money to celebrate Passover. I am 80 years old. I have always kept Passover and this may be the last time. But I do not want to go to Abraham's bosom with any regret as I forgive my daughter, so I hope to be forgiven. And I want to keep my Passover. It is a long way, Father. The way to heaven is even longer if one is not present at the right. Are you going by yourself? And if you feel ill on the way, the angel of God will close my eyes. Jesus caresses his white, trembling head and asks the woman, And what about you? I am looking for work. If I were better fed, I would get rid of my fever. And if I were cured, I could work at the court. Do you think that food alone could cure you? No, you could too. But I am a poor thing, too poor to ask you for mercy. And if I cured you, what would you like afterwards? Nothing else. I would already have had more than I could hope for. Jesus smiles and hands her a piece of bread dipped into some water and vinegar, which I think is their drink. The woman eats it without speaking and Jesus continues smiling. The meal is over. 
It was so frugal. The apostles and disciples looked for a shady place along the slopes and among the thickets. Jesus remains under the tent. The old man is lying on the grass, and tired as he was, has fallen asleep. After a short time, the woman, who had gone away looking for some shade where to rest, comes towards Jesus, who smiles at her to cheer her up. She comes forward looking shy but happy, almost as far as the tent. She is then overcome by joy. She walks with a vigorous stride and, falling flat on her face with a choked cry, exclaims, You have cured me! May you be blessed! At this time I used to shiver with fever. But I am not now. Oh! And she kisses Jesus' feet. Are you sure that you have been cured? I did not tell you. It might be by chance. Oh, no. Now I understand your smile when you handed me the bread. Your virtue entered me with that morsel. I have nothing to give you in exchange except my heart. Order your maid, Lord, and she will obey you until she dies. Yes. See that old man? He is all alone and he is just. You had a husband, and death took him away. He had a daughter, and selfishness took her away. And that is worse. And yet, he does not curse. But it is not fair that he should go about alone in his last hours. Be a daughter to him. Yes, my lord. Mind you, it means working for two. I am strong now, and I will do it. Go up there, then, to that cliff, and tell the man who is resting there, the one wearing a grey tunic, to come to me. The woman goes away quickly and comes back with Simon's elet. Come, Simon, I want to speak to you. Woman, Wait here. Jesus walks away for a few yards. Do you think that Lazarus would find it difficult to take on another worker? Lazarus? I do not think that he even knows how many servants he has. One more, one less. But who is it? That woman. I cured her, and that is enough, master. If you cured her, it means that you love her. What you love is sacred to Lazarus. I commit myself for him. That is true. What I love is sacred to Lazarus. You are right. And that is why Lazarus will become a saint. Because by loving what I love, he will love perfection. I want to join that old man to that woman and let that patriarch keep his last Passover in great joy. I am very fond of old, holy people, and I am happy if I can give them a serene sunset. You love also children. Yes, and sick people. And those who weep, and those who are alone. Oh, my master, don't you realize that you are fond of everybody, also of your enemies? I do not realize it, Simon. To love is my nature. There, the patriarch is waking up. 
Let us go and tell him that he will be keeping Passover with a daughter beside him, and without any more need for bread. They go back to the tent where the old woman is waiting for them, and the three of them go towards the old man, who has sat up and is tying his sandals. What are you going to do, father? I am going down to the valley. I hope to find some shelter for the night. And tomorrow I will beg on the road and then down, down in a month's time. If I am not dead, I will be in the temple. No. Must I not? Why? Because God does not want it. You will not go alone. This woman will come with you. She will take you where I tell her, and you will be made welcome for my sake. You will keep your Passover, but without any trouble. You have already carried your cross, Father. Put it down now. All you have to do is to concentrate in prayer, thanking the good Lord. But why? Why? I... I do not deserve so much. You are daughter? It is more than if you gave me twenty years. And where, where are you sending me? The old man is weeping into his long beard. I am sending you to Lazarus of Theophilus. I do not know whether you know him. Oh, I come from the border of Syria, and I remember Theophilus. But, oh, blessed son of God, allow me to bless you. And Jesus sitting on the grass in front of the old man, does bend his head to let him impose solemnly his hands on it, thundering out in a deep, very deep voice, the old blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord uncover his face to you and bring you peace. Jesus, Simon, and the woman reply together. Amen. The Poem of the Man-God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 173 The Sermon of the Mount The Beatitudes Part 4 27th of May, 1945 The Sermon of the Mount continues The crowd is growing larger and larger as the days go by. There are men women, old people, children, rich and poor alike. The couple, Stephen and Hermas, is always present, although not yet associated with the old disciples led by Isaac. And there is also the new couple formed yesterday, the old man and the woman. They are in the front row near their comforter, and they look much more cheerful than yesterday. The old man, to make up for the many months or years during which he was neglected by his daughter, has laid his wrinkled hand on the knees of the woman, and she is caressing it out of the inborn instinct of a morally sound woman to be maternal. Jesus passes near them to climb up to his rustic pulpit, and while passing he caresses the head of the old man who looks at him 
as if he already saw him as God. Peter says something to Jesus, who makes a gesture as if he wanted to say it does not matter. But I do not understand what the apostle says. Peter remains near Jesus, and Judas, Thaddeus, and Matthew join him. The other apostles are scattered among the crowd. Peace be with you all. Yesterday, I spoke of prayer, of swearing, of fasting. Today, I want to instruct you in other perfections. They are also prayer, trust, sincerity, love, and religion. The first thing I will speak to you of is the right use of riches, changed into as many treasures in heaven by the goodwill of the faithful servant. The treasures of the earth do not last, but the treasures of heaven are eternal. Are you fond of what is yours? Are you sorry to die because you will no longer be able to look after your property and you will have to leave it? In that case, transfer them to heaven. You may say, what is of the earth will not enter heaven. And you have taught us that money is the filthiest thing on earth. How can we transpose them to heaven? No, you cannot take money, material as it is, into the kingdom where everything is spiritual. But you can take the fruit of money. When you give a banker your money, why do you do it? That he may make it bear interest. You do not deprive yourselves of it, not even temporarily, that he may give you back ten plus one or even more. Then you become happy and you praise the banker. Otherwise, you say, he is honest, but he is a fool. And if instead of ten plus one, he should give you nine, saying, I lost the rest, you would denounce him and send him to prison. What is the fruit of money? Does the banker sow your money and water it to make it grow? No. The fruit is given by a skillful handling of business, so that by means of mortgage deeds and loans at interest, the money is increased by the premium rightly requested for the loan of the gold. Is it not so? Now listen. God gives you earthly riches. To some people he grants a great deal, to some only as much as they need to live. And he says to you, now it is up to you. I have given them to you. Gain by these means an end, as my love wishes for your own good. I have entrusted you with them, but not that you may turn them into evil. Make your wealth bear interest for this real fatherland, both because of the reputation I hold you in and out of gratitude for my gifts. And here is the method to gain this end. Do not accumulate your treasures on the earth, living for them being cruel for them, cursed by your neighbour and by God on account of them. It is not worth it. They are never safe in this world. Thieves can always rob you. Fire can always destroy your houses. 
Diseases of plants and animals can exterminate herds and orchards. How many things undermine your property? Whether it is real estate and unassailable, such as houses and gold, whether its nature is liable to be damaged, such as all living things, vegetables and animals, or precious clothes, they can be ruined. Thunderbolts, fire and floods can destroy houses, thieves, blight, dry weather, rodents and insects can damage fields, catching diseases, fever, crippling, moraine can destroy cattle, moths and mice can ruin valuable pieces of cloth and precious pieces of furniture, oxidization can corrode vases, Chandeliers and artistic gates. Everything is subject to destruction. But if you turn earthly welfare into supernatural good, then it becomes free from all damage by time, men and calamities. Store up your treasure in heaven where thieves cannot break in, and where no calamities occur. Work with merciful love for all the miseries of the earth. You may caress your money and kiss it if you wish so. You may rejoice at the plentiful crops, at the vineyards laden with grapes, at the countless number of olives, which bend the branches of the olive trees, and at your profile sheep with turgid udders. You may rejoice at all that, but not in a sterile or human way. Rejoice with love and admiration, with supernatural delight and foresight. Thank you, my God, for this money, for these crops, plants, sheep, and for this business. Thank you, sheep, plants, meadows, business, which serve me so well. May you all be blessed, because through your goodness, O Eternal Father, and through yours, O things of mine, I can do so much good to those who are hungry, or are naked, homeless, sick, alone. Last year, I did it for ten. This year, as I have more money, although I gave away much as arms, and the crops are more plentiful, and the flocks larger, I will give twice, three times as much as last year, so that everybody... Also those who have no wealth of their own may partake of my joy and bless with me the eternal Lord. That is the prayer of a just man, a prayer which joined to your deeds transfers your wealth to heaven and not only keeps it eternally for you, but you will find it increased by the holy fruit of love. Store your treasure in heaven, so that your heart may also be there, above and beyond the risk that not only your gold, your houses, fields and herds may suffer damage, but that your very heart may be attacked and robbed, corroded, burnt and killed by the spirit of the world. If you do that, you will have your treasure in your heart, because you will have God within you until the blessed day when you will be in him. But in order not to diminish the fruit of charity, take care to be charitable in a supernatural spirit. What I said in regard to prayer and to fasting applies also to charity and to any other good action you may do. 
keep the good you may do, free from the violating sensation of the world. Keep it immune from human praise. Do not profane the scented rose of your charity and of your good deeds, as it is a true censer of perfumes agreeable to the Lord. Good is profaned by a proud spirit, by the desire to be noted when doing good, and by the quest for praise. The rose of charity is then dribbled and eaten away by the big slimy snails of satisfied pride, and the censer is filled with the fetid straw of the litter on which the proud man basks like a well-fed animal. Oh, those deeds of charity accomplished to be pointed out by people. It would be better, much better, if they had not been performed at all. Who does not do them commits a sin of harshness. Who does them, letting people know both the amount given and the name of the person to whom it was given, and begging for praise, commits the sin of pride by making the offer known. As he says, see how much I can afford. Sins against charity, because he humbles the beneficiary by making his name known, and commits the sin of spiritual avarice as he wants to store up human praise. It is straw, nothing but straw. Let God and his angels praise you. When you give alms, do not have it trumpeted before you to draw the attention of passers-by and win their praise, as the hypocrites do, who want to be praised by men and thus give alms only where they can be seen by many people. They too have received their reward and will not have another one from God. Do not commit the same sin and do not be so presumptuous. But when you give alms, your left hand must not know what your right is doing. So secret and modest is your almsgiving, and then forget about it. Do not linger admiring your deed, swelling with it like the toad that contemplates itself with its veiled eyes in the pond, and sees also the clouds, trees, and the chart near the bank reflected in the still water. And when it sees that it is so small as compared to them, which is so large, it swells up with air until it bursts. Also, your charity is nothing as compared to the infinite, which is the charity of God. And if you wanted to become like him and make your small charity so big as to be equal to his, you would fill yourselves with the wind of pride and would end up by perishing. Forget about it. Forget about the action itself. A light, sweet voice will always be present with you and will make your day bright, sweet and happy because that light will be the smile of God. The honey will be the spiritual peace which still comes from God. And the voice will be the voice of God, the Father, who will say to you, thank you. He sees the hidden evil and the concealed good and will give you a reward for that. I can, Master, you give the lie to your own words. The sudden resentful remarks comes from the centre of the crowd. 
they all turn round in the direction of the voice. There is some confusion. Peter says, I told you! Ah, when there is one of those over there, everything goes wrong! Many people in the crowd hiss and grumble against the reviler. Jesus is the only one who remains calm. He has folded his arms and is standing, tall as he is, on his rock, with the sun in front of him, in his dark blue tunic. The reviler, heedless of the reaction of the crowd, goes on. You are a bad master because you teach what you do not do. And be quiet, go away, shame, shout the crowd and again. Go back to your scribes. The master is quite enough for us. Let the hypocrites go with the hypocrites. You false masters, usurers. And they continue. But Jesus thunders out. Silence. Let him speak. And the crowds no longer shout, but they whisper their insults, glaring at him at the same time. Yes. You teach what you do not do. You told us that we should give alms without being seen. And yesterday, in the presence of a whole crowd, you said to two poor people, Stay and I will appease your hunger. I said, Let the two poor people stay here. They will be the blessed guests who will give flavour to our bread. Nothing else. I did not say I wanted to satisfy their hunger. Which poor man has not at least some bread? It was my joy to extend to them our good friendship. Of course, you are cunning and you can play the lamb. The old man stands up, turns round, and raising his walking stick, he shouts, Infernal tongue, who are accusing the Holy One? Do you think that you know everything, and that you can accuse him of what you know? As you do not know who God is, and who he is whom you are insulting. So you do not know his deeds. Only the angels and my overjoyed heart know. Listen, men, listen, everybody, and see whether Jesus is the liar and the proud man that this traitor to the temple is saying. He, be quiet, Ismael, be quiet for my sake. If I made you happy, please make me happy by being silent. Jesus begs him. I obey you, holy son, but let me say only this thing. The blessing of an old faithful Israelite is on him who assisted me in the name of God. And God put that blessing on my lips for me and for Sarah, my new daughter. But there will be no blessing on your head. I will not curse you. I will not foul with a curse, my mouth, which must say to God, receive me. I did not do it to her who disowned me, and I have already received a divine reward for it. But there is one who will take the place of the innocent you are accusing, and of Ishmael, the friend of God, Who assists him? A chorus of shouts closes the speech of the old man, 
who sits down again, while a man sneaks away, followed by insults. The crowds then shout to Jesus, Go on, go on, holy master! We will listen only to you. Listen to us, not to those cursed birds of evil omen. They are jealous because we love you more than we love them. But you are holy, they are wicked. Go on, speak to us. You can see that we have no other wish but to hear you. Our homes, our business, they are nothing. We left them to hear you. Yes, I will speak to you. But do not be upset by what happened. Pray for those poor people. Forgive them as I do. Because if you forgive men their faults, also your Father who is in heaven will forgive you your sins. But if you bear men a grudge and do not forgive them, neither will your Father forgive you your shortcomings. And everybody needs to be forgiven. I was saying to you that God will give you a reward even if you do not ask to be rewarded for the good you have done. But do not do good to be rewarded, to have a security for tomorrow. Do not do good restricted with narrow limits by fear. And after will I have enough for myself? And should I have nothing, who will help me? Will I find anyone who will do what I did? And when I will no longer be able to give, will I still be loved? Look, I have mighty friends among rich people, and I have friends amongst the poor people of the earth. And I solemnly tell you that the mighty ones are not the most loved. I go to them not for my own sake or profit, but because they can give me much for those who have nothing. I am poor. I have nothing. I would like to have all the treasures in the world and change them into bread for those who are hungry, into homes for the homeless, into clothes for the naked, and into medicines for the sick. You may say you can cure people. Yes, I can do that and other things. But I do not always find faith in men. And I cannot do what I would do and would like to do if the hearts of men had faith in me. I would like to help also those who have no faith. And as they do not ask the Son of Man for miracles, I would like, as a man to man, to help them. But I have nothing. That is why I stretch out my hand to those who are rich, and I ask them, Give me some arms in the name of God. That is why I have high-placed friendships. Tomorrow, when I am no longer on the earth, there will still be poor people. But I shall not be there to work miracles for those who have faith, nor to give arms to lead to faith. But then, my rich friends who are in touch with me will have learned how to help. And my apostles after their experience with me, will have learned how to give alms out of love for their brothers. And the poor will always receive assistance. Yesterday, I received from one who has nothing, more than all those who are rich have given to me. He is a friend and as poor as I am but he gave me something which no money can buy and which made me happy, bringing back to me so many serene hours of my childhood and youth 
when every evening the hands of a just one were laid on my head and I went to rest with the blessing as the guardian of my sleep. Yesterday, this poor friend of mine made me king with his blessing. You thus see that none of my rich friends has given me what he gave me. Therefore, be not afraid. Even if you no longer have the power of money, providing you have love and holiness, you can still assist who is poor, tired, and distressed. And I therefore say to you, do not worry too much because you are afraid of having too little. You will always have what is necessary. Do not worry too much about your future. Nobody knows how much future there is ahead of him. Do not worry about what you will eat to support yourselves in life or what clothes you will put on to keep your bodies warm. The life of your souls is by far more precious than its clothes. And your father knows. You ought to know, too. Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns. And yet, they do not starve to death. Because the heavenly father feeds them. And you, men the favourite creature of the Father, are worth much, much more than they are. Which of you, with all his talent, can add one single cubit to his height? If you cannot raise your height even by a span, how can you possibly change your future conditions, increasing your wealth, to ensure that you will live to a long and happy old age. Can you say to death, you shall come for me when I want? You cannot. Why, then, worry about your future? And why go to so much trouble, lest you should be left without clothes? Think of the lilies growing in the field. They do not work or spin. They do not buy any clothes from vendors. Yet I assure you that not even Solomon in all his regalia was robed like one of them. Now, if that is how God clothes the grass in the field, which is there today and will be thrown into the furnace tomorrow, or used to feed the cattle and will thus end up in ash or dung, how much more he will see to you, his children. Do not be of little faith. Do not worry about an uncertain future, saying, what shall I eat when I am old? What shall I drink? How will I clothe myself? Leave such worries to the Gentiles who do not have the lofty certainty of the divine paternity. You have it, and you know that the Father is aware of your needs and loves you. Therefore trust him. Seek first what is really necessary. Faith, goodness, charity. Humility, mercy, purity, justice, meekness. The three and four main virtues and all the others as well. In order to be the friends of God and have a right to his kingdom. And I can assure you that all the rest will be given to you as well without having to ask for it. There is no rich man richer than a saint or any man safer than he is. 
God is with the saint and the saint is with God. He does not ask anything for his body and God supplies what is necessary. But he works for his soul and God gives himself to him in this world and a paradise in the next one. So do not go to any trouble for what is not worth your trouble. Let your imperfections grieve you, not your scanty earthly means. Do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself, and you will take care of it when you live it. Why worry today? Is life not already quite full of yesterday's sad memories and of today's troubles? That we should feel the need to add the nightmares of tomorrow's uncertainties? Leave to each day its own trouble. There will always be in life more pains than we would wish, without adding the present pains to future ones. Always say the great word of God today. You are his children, created to his likeness. So say with him today. And today I give you my blessing. May it accompany you until the beginning of a new today, of tomorrow. That is when I will give you once again my peace in the name of God. The Poem of the Man-God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 174 The Sermon of the Mount The Beatitudes Part 5 Encounter with the Magdalene 29th of May, 1945. It is a glorious morning and the air is clearer than usual. Distances seem to be shortened and remote things seem to be seen through a magnifying lens. So clear and neat are the least details. The crowds are getting ready to listen to the master. Day by day, the country is becoming more beautiful in its luxurious dress at the height of the springtime season, which in Palestine, I think, is at end of March and beginning of April, because later it has to look typical of summertime, with ripe crops and thick, fully developed foliage. The whole country is now in bloom. From the height of the mountain, which is adorned with its own flowers, even in spots which would appear least suitable for blossoming growth. One can see the flexuous corn undulating down in the plain, blown by the breeze, making it look like sea-green waves, with a pale golden hue at the top of the ears, now seeding in their bristly orbs. The fruit trees, completely covered with petals, stand straight above the crops, undulating in the light breeze, and look like as many huge powder puffs or balls of white, pale pink, dark pink, bright red galls. The olive trees, by contrast, in their dress of penitent ascetics, seem to be praying and their prayers are already changing into a tentative snowfall of tiny white flowers. The top of Mount Hermon is like pink alabaster and is kissed by the sun. Two diamond threads, they look like threads from here, run down from the alabaster top, twinkling in an unbelievable fashion in the sun, and disappear into the green woods. They appear once again down in the valley, where they form watercourses which flow towards Lake Merrim, which cannot be seen from here. They then flow out with the beautiful waters of the Jordan, and later drop into the light sapphire sea of Galilee, which twinkles like chips of precious stones set in and lit up by the sun. The sails moving on the lake, calm and splendid in its 
frame of gardens and wonderful countryside seem driven by small light clouds sailing in the sea of the sky. Nature really seems to be smiling in this early hour of a spring day. And the crowds throng incessantly. They come up from all directions, old, healthy, sick, children and young couples who wish to start their married life with the blessing of God's word. There are beggars and wealthy people who call the apostles and give them offerings for those who are poor. And they are all so anxious to find a concealed place in which to do it, that they seem to be going to confession. Thomas has taken one of the travelling bags and calmly pours all the money into it, as if it were chicken feet, and then takes it to the rock where Jesus is speaking. And he laughs happily, saying, Rejoice, Master, we have enough for everybody today. Jesus smiles and says, And we shall start at once, so that those who are sad may be happy immediately. You and your companions will select the poor and sick people and bring them here. That takes a comparatively short time, although they have to listen to the cases of many people, and it would have taken much longer without the practical help of Thomas, who, standing on a stone to be seen by everybody, shouts in his powerful voice, All those suffering from physical trouble, go to my right-hand side over there, in the shade. The Iscariot follows his example, as he, too, is gifted with an exceptionally powerful and beautiful voice, and he shouts, And all those who think they are entitled to arms should come here near me, and make sure you're not telling lies, because the eyes of the master can read your hearts. The crowds start moving about to form three groups, those who are sick, those who are poor, and those who are anxious only to hear Jesus' teachings. But two people, and then three of the last group, seem to be in need of something which is neither health nor money, but is more necessary than both, a woman and two men. They look at the apostles but dare not speak. The severe-looking Simon Zealot passes by. Also Peter passes by. He is busy speaking to a dozen little children to whom he promises some olives if they keep quiet until the end of the sermon, and a thrashing if they disturb while the master is speaking. The elderly grave Bartholomew passes by. Matthew and Philip passed, carrying a cripple who would have to struggle too much to open his way through the crowd. Also the cousins of the Lord pass by, helping an almost blind beggar and a very old poor woman. I wonder how old she is, who weeps, telling James all her troubles. James of Zebedee passes by, holding in his arms a poor girl, who is certainly ill, and whom he has taken from her mother to ensure that she does not get hurt by the crowds, while the panting mother follows him. The last to pass are Andrew and John, whom I would call the invisible ones, because while John, in his serene simplicity of a holy child, is willing to go with his companions, Andrew, on account of his reservedness, prefers going with his old fishing companion and fellow disciple of the Baptist. They had stayed at the junction of the two main paths to show people to their places, but there being no more pilgrims on the stony path of the mountain, the two have come together to go to the master with the last offerings received. Jesus is already bending over sick people, and the hosannas of the crowds punctuate each miracle. The woman, who appears to be completely distressed, dares to pull John's tunic while he is speaking to Andrew and she smiles. He bends and asks her, What do you want, woman? I would like to speak to the master. Are you not well? You are not poor. 
I am well and I am not poor, but I need him. Because there are evils without any fever, and there is misery without poverty, and mine, mine. And she weeps. Listen, Andrew, this woman is sick in heart and would like to speak to the bastard. What shall we do? Andrew looks at the woman and says, It is certainly something which is painful to tell. The woman nods assent. Andrew goes on. Do not weep. John, try and take her behind our shed. I will take the master there. And John, smiling, begs people to let him pass, while Andrew goes in the opposite direction towards Jesus. But they are noticed by two distressed men, and one of them stops John, and the other Andrew, and shortly afterwards they are both with John and the woman behind the shed of the branches, which is part of the tent. Andrew reaches Jesus when the latter is curing the dip cripple who raises his crutches like two trophies, as brisk as a skilled dancer, shouting his blessing. Andrew whispers, Master, behind our shed there are three people weeping, but it is their hearts that ache, and their grief cannot be made No. All right, I still have this girl and this woman, then I will come. Go and tell them to have faith. Andrew goes away while Jesus is bending over the little girl who is being held once again by her mother. What is your name? Jesus asks her. Mary. And what is my name? Jesus, replies the child. And who am I? The Messiah of the Lord, who has come to bring good to bodies and souls. Who told you? My mother and father, who hope in you for my life. Live and be good. The child, whose spine, I think, was affected by a disease, because although she is about seven years old, and perhaps older, she only moved her hands and was all enveloped in thick, stiff bandages from her armpit down to her hips. They can be seen because her mother has lifted her dress to show them. Remains, as she was, for a few minutes, then begins to slide down from her mother's lap onto the ground and runs towards Jesus, who is curing the woman, whose case I do not understand. All the sick people have been satisfied, and they are the ones who shout most in the crowd, applauding, The Son of David! Glory to God and ours! Jesus goes towards the shed. Judas of Kerioth shouts, Master, what about these? Jesus turns round and says, Let them wait where they are. They will be comforted too. And he walks fast to the back of the shed where the three people in anguish are with Andrew and John. The woman first. Come with me into these hedges. Speak without any fear. My Lord, my husband wants to leave me for a prostitute. I have five children, and the last one is two years old. Great is my grief, and I am worried about my children. I do not know whether he will take them or leave them to me. He will certainly want the boys, at least the oldest one, and I who bore him will no longer have the joy of seeing him. <laughs> and what will they think of their father and of me? They must think evil of one of us. And I would not like them to judge their father. Do not weep. I am the master of life and death. Your husband will not marry that woman. Go in peace and continue to be good. But, but you will not kill him. Oh, Lord, I love him. Jesus smiles. I will not kill anyone, but there is someone who
who will do his work. You must know that the demon is not greater than God. When you go back to your town, you will find out that someone killed that evil creature, and in such a way that your husband will realize what he was doing and will love you again with revived love. The woman kisses the hand that Jesus had laid on her head and goes away. One of the men comes. I have a daughter, Lord. Unfortunately, she went to Tiberias with some girl friends, and it was as if she had taken some poison. When she came back to me, she was like a mad woman. She wants to go away with a Greek man. And then, why was she born? Her mother is heartbroken and perhaps will die of grief. I own your words, which I heard last winter. Keep me from killing her. But I tell you, my heart has already cursed her. No, God, who is a father, only curses an accomplished and obstinate sin. What do you want from me? That you get her to mend her ways. I do not know her, and she will certainly not come to me. But you can change her heart also from far away. Do you know who sent me to you, Johanna of Cusa? She was leaving for Jerusalem when I went to her mansion to ask her whether she knew that wretched Greek. I was afraid she might not know him, because she is good, although she lives at Tiberias. But since Cusa has contacts with the Gentiles, she does not know him. But she said to me, Go to Jesus. He called my soul back from very far away. He cured me by that call of mine, Thysis. He will cure also your daughter's heart. I will pray, and you must have faith. I have faith. You can see it. Have mercy on me, master. Your daughter this evening will weep on her mother's knees, asking to be forgiven. You must be as good as her mother and forgive her. The past is dead. Yes, master, as you wish, and may you be blessed. He turns round to go away, but retraces his steps. Forgive me, master, but I am so afraid. Lust is such a demon. Give me a thread of your tunic. I will put it in my daughter's pillow. The demon will not tempt her while she's asleep. Jesus smiles and shakes his head, but satisfies the man, saying, that your mind may be quiet. But you must believe that when God says, I want it, the demon goes away without any further need. So keep this as a souvenir of mine. And he gives him a small tuft from his fringe. The third man comes. Master, my father died. We thought he had some money, but we did not find any. That would not matter, as my brothers and I are not short of bread. But I lived with my father, as I am the eldest. The other two brothers are now accusing me of stealing the money. And they want to sue me for theft. You can see my heart. I did not see one single coin. My father kept his money in a coffer in a metal case. When he died, we opened the coffer, but the case was no longer there. 
They say, last night while we were sleeping, you took it. It is not true. Help me to restore peace and esteem among us. Jesus stares at him and smiles. Why are you smiling, Master? Because your father is the guilty one. The guilt of a child who hides his toy lest someone should take it. But he was not a miser. Believe me, he was charitable. I know. But he was very old. It is the disease of old people. He wanted to preserve things for you. And out of too much love, he caused you to fall out with one another. But the case is buried at the foot of the cellar steps. I am telling you so that you may be aware that I know. While I am speaking to you by pure chance, your younger brother, by striking the ground angrily, caused it to vibrate, and so they discovered it, and they are now embarrassed and sorry for blaming you. Go back home with a quiet mind and be good to them. Do not reproach them for their lack of esteem. No, my lord, I will not. But I am not going home. I am staying here to hear you. I will go tomorrow. And if they take that money? You said that we must not be greedy. I do not want to be so. It is enough for me if there is peace amongst us. On the other hand, I did not know how much money there was in the case and thus I will not suffer for any information contrary to the truth. And I consider that that money might have been lost. I will live now as I've lived before, should they deny me it. It is enough if they do not call me a thief. You are well advanced on the way of God. Proceed and peace be with you. And also that man goes away happily. Jesus goes back to the crowds, towards the poor people, and gives them alms according to his own judgment. Everybody is now happy, and Jesus can speak. Peace be with you. I explain the ways of the Lord to you, that you may follow them. Could you follow the path that goes down on the right-hand side and at the same time follow the one on the left-hand side? You could not. Because if you take one, you must leave the other. Even if the two paths were close together, you could not walk any length with one foot in one and the other in the other. You would end up by being tired and making a mistake, even if there was a wager. But between the path of God and Satan's, there is a great distance, which becomes greater and greater, just like the two paths that come out up here. But as they run down the valley, they become farther and farther from each other. As one goes towards Capernaum and the other towards Ptolemy. Such is life. It bestrides past and future, good and evil. Man is in the centre with his willpower and free will. At the end, on one side there is God and his heaven, on the other side Satan and his hell. Man can choose. Nobody forces him. Do not say to me, Satan tempts us as an excuse for descending towards the low path. Also God tempts with his love, which is very strong, with his words, 
which are most holy, with his promises, which are most alluring. Why, then, should you allow yourselves to be tempted by one only of the two, by the most undeserving one to be listened to? Are God's words, promises, love not sufficient to counteract Satan's poison? Consider that that is not to your favor. When a man is physically very healthy, he is not immune from contagion, but overcomes it quite easily. Whereas if a man is already ill and consequently weak, he will almost certainly die in the event of catching a new infection. And if he survives, he is more seriously ill than previously because his blood lacks the strength to kill the contagious germs completely. The same applies to the superior part. If a man is morally and spiritually healthy and strong, you may be sure that he is not free from temptations, but evil does not strike roots in him. When I hear anyone say to me, I approach this man and that one, I read this book and that one, I endeavoured to persuade this person and that to do good, but in actual fact, the evil which was in their minds and in their hearts, the evil which was in the book entered my heart. I conclude, which proves that you had already created within yourself a suitable ground for penetration, which proves that you are a weakling, lacking in moral and spiritual strength because we must derive some good also from our enemies. By watching their errors, we must learn not to fall into the same. An intelligent man does not become the laughingstock of the first doctrine he hears. A man saturated with a doctrine cannot make room in his mind for another. This explains the difficulties met when one endeavours to convince those who are persuaded of other doctrines to follow the true doctrine. But if you admit that you change your mind like a weathercock, I can see that you are thoroughly empty, that your spiritual stronghold is full of breaches that the dam of your mind is leaking in hundreds of places through which good water runs out and foul water runs in. And you are so stupid and listless that you are not even aware of it and you do not see it. You are a wretch. Of the two paths, therefore, Choose the good one and proceed on it, resisting to the allurements of the senses, of the world, of science, and of the demon. Leave half-faiths, compromises, pacts with two people, one opposed to the other, to the men of the world. They too should avoid them if they are honest. At least you men of God must shun them. You cannot have them either with God or with mammon. You must not have them with yourselves either, because they would be of no value. If your actions are a mixture of good and evil, they are 
of no value whatsoever. The entirely good ones would be cancelled by the bad ones. The evil ones would lead you straight into the enemy's arms. Therefore, do not indulge in them. Be loyal in your service. No one can serve two masters with two different minds. He will either love one and hate the other, or vice versa. You cannot be both of God and of mammon. The spirit of God cannot be conciliated with the spirit of the world. The former ascends, the latter descends. The former sanctifies, the latter corrupts. And if you are corrupt, how can you act with purity? Senses light up in corrupt people, and other lusts follow senses. You already know how Eve was corrupted, and how Adam became corrupt through her. Satan kissed the woman's eyes and bewitched them so that every aspect so far pure became impure for her and roused strange curiosities. Then Satan kissed her ears and opened them to the words of a new science, his own. Also Eve's mind wanted to know what was not necessary. Then Satan showed her eyes and mind, now awake to evil, what previously they had not seen or understood, and everything in Eve became sharp and corrupt. And the woman went to the man, revealed her secret, and persuaded Adam to taste of the new fruit so beautiful to the eye and so strictly forbidden so far. And she kissed him and looked at him with mouth and eyes already fouled by Satan's gloomy disorder. And corruption penetrated Adam, who saw, and through his eyes he craved for what was forbidden and he bit it with his helpmate, and fell from such height into mud. A corrupt person will draw another person to corruption, unless the latter is a saint in the true sense of the word. Watch your eyes, men, both the eyes of your bodies and the eyes of your minds. If they are corrupt, they can but corrupt all the rest. The eye is the light of the body. Your thought is the light of your heart. But if your eye is not pure, because since the organs are subject to thought, a corrupt thought will corrupt also senses. Everything in you will become obscure. And the seducing haze will create impure phantasm in you. Everything is pure in him who has a pure thought, which causes a pure look, and the light of God descends as a master where there is no obstruction of senses. But if out of ill will you have accustomed your eyes to disorderly visions, everything will become darkness in you. In vain you will look at the most holy things. In the darkness they will be nothing but blackness and blackness will be the deeds accomplished by you.
Therefore, O children of God, defend yourselves against yourselves. Look after yourselves diligently against all temptations. There is no evil in being tempted. An athlete prepares himself for victory, fighting. But it is evil to be overcome because you are not prepared and you are negligent. I know that everything serves as a temptation. I know that defense is exhausting. I know that it is tiring to have a struggle. But think of what you will gain through these things. And for one hour of pleasure, what kind it may be, would you like to lose an eternity of peace? What does the pleasure of the flesh of gold, of thoughts, leave you? Nothing. What do you gain by rejecting them? Everything. I am speaking to sinners because man is a sinner. Well, tell me the truth. After satisfying your senses, your pride, your greed, have you felt fresher? Happier? Safer? In the hour following your satisfaction, which is always the time of meditation, have you sincerely felt that you were happy? I have never tasted the bread of sensuality, but I will reply in your stead. No. Langer, unhappiness, uncertainty, nausea, fear, restlessness. That was the juice squeezed out of the hour spent in pleasure. But I beg you, while I say to you, never do that, I also say to you, do not be inflexible with those who make mistakes. Remember that you all are brothers, made of one flesh and one soul. Consider that there are many reasons why one is led to sin. Be merciful towards sinners and kindly help them and take them back to God showing them that the path they have followed is full of dangers for the flesh, the mind, and the spirit. Do that, and you will receive a great reward. Because the Father who is in heaven is merciful to good people, and he knows how to give you one hundredfold to one. Now I say to you. And here Jesus tells me that you must copy the vision dated 12th of August 1944 from line 35 to the end, that is, to the departure of Mary Magdalene. 12th of August 1944. Jesus says, Look and write. It is the gospel of mercy that I give to everybody, and in particular to those women who will recognise themselves in the sinner, and whom I invite to follow her in her redemption. Jesus is standing on a rock and is speaking to a large crowd. It is a mountainous place, a lonely hill between two valleys. The top of the hill is shaped like a yoke, or rather, like a camel's hump. So that, a few yards from the top, there is a natural amphitheatre, where voices resound clearly, as in a well-built concert hall. 
The hill is all in flower, it must be summer. The crops down in the plain are beginning to ripen and are getting ready to be cut. The glacier of a high mountain in the north is shining in the sun. Directly below, to the east, the Sea of Galilee looks like a mirror, broken into numberless fragments, each of which is a sapphire lit up by the sun. Its blue-gold twinkling is dazzling, and it reflects a few fluffy clouds in a very clear sky, and the shadow of some swift sails. Beyond the Lake of Gennesaret, there is a vast extent of plain ground which, because of a light mist near the earth, caused, perhaps by evaporation of dew, in fact it must be early morning as the grass on the mountain still has a few dewy diamonds glittering on its stems, looks like a continuation of the lake, with an opal-like hue veined with greens. Further back, there is a chain of mountains, the side of which is so bizarre as to give the impression of clouds stretched on the clear sky. Some of the people are sitting on the grass, some on large stones, some are standing. The apostolic college is not complete. I can see Peter and Andrew, John and James, and I can hear the other two being called Nathaniel and Philip. Then there is one who is and is not one of the group. Perhaps he is the last one who arrived. They call him Simon. The others are not there, unless they are among the crowds and I cannot see them. The sermon has already started. I understand that it is the Sermon of the Mount, but the Beatitudes have already been proclaimed. I would say that the sermon is drawing towards the close, because Jesus says, Do that and you will receive a great reward, because the Father who is in heaven is merciful to good people and he knows how to give you one hundredfold to one. So I say to you, there is much excitement amongst the people who crowd round the path leading to the tableau. The people closest to Jesus turn their heads round. Everybody's attention is distracted. Jesus stops speaking and turns his eyes in the same direction as the others. He is serious and handsome in his dark blue tunic, his arms folded on his chest, while the first rays of the sun, rising above the eastern peak of the hill, shine on his head. Make room, you plebeians, shouts the angry voice of a man. Make room for the beauty who is passing. And four dandies, smartly dressed, come forward, one of whom is certainly Roman, because he is wearing a Roman toga. They are carrying Mary of Magdala, still a great sinner, triumphantly on their hands, crossed to form a seat. And she smiles with her beautiful mouth, throwing back her head and her golden hair, which is all plates and curls held by precious hairpins, and a pale gold leaf strewn with pearls, which encircles the upper part of her forehead like a diadem, from which small light curls hang down to veil her splendid eyes, made larger and more seductive by a refined makeup. The diadem disappears behind her ears, under the mass of plates at the back of her snow-white, completely bare neck. And her nakedness extends much further than her neck. Her shoulders are bare down to her shoulder blades, and the breast is even more so. Her dress is held on her shoulders by two little gold chains. It is completely sleeveless. Her body is covered, so to say by a veil, the only purpose of which is to protect her skin from sunburn. The dress is of a very light fabric, and when she throws herself back out of affection against one or the other of her lovers, she seems to be doing so completely nude. 
I am under the impression that the Roman is the one she prefers, because she glances and smiles at him more frequently and rests her head on his shoulder. The desire of the goddess has been satisfied, says the Roman. Rome has acted as a mount for the new Venus. Over there, there is the Apollo you wanted to see. Seduce him, therefore, but leave some crumbs of your charm also to us. Mary laughs, and with an agile, provoking movement, she jumps to the ground, showing her small feet shod in white sandals with golden buckles, as well as a good length of her leg. Then her dress covers her whole body. It is in fact a very wide one of snow-white wool, as thin as a veil, held tight at the waist, very low near her sides, by a large belt made of supple gold bosses. And she stands on the green tableland, where there is a vast amount of lilies of the valley and wild narcissi, like a flower of flesh, an impure flower, which is opened there by witchcraft. She is more beautiful than ever. Her tiny purple lips seem a carnation opening on the whiteness of her perfect set of teeth. Her face and body would satisfy the most exacting painter or sculptor, both because of her complexion and her figure. With her broad breast, her perfectly sized sides, her naturally supple slender waist, as compared with her sides and breast, she does look like a goddess, as the Roman said. A goddess sculptured in a light pinkish marble on the sides of which a fabric is draped and then hangs in the front of a mass of folds. Everything has been devised to please. Jesus stares at her and she defiantly resists his look while she smiles and twists lightly as the Roman tickles her running on her bare shoulders and breast, a lily picked among the grass. Mary, with affected indignation, lifts a veil, saying, Have respect for my innocence, which causes the four to burst into a guffaw. Jesus continues staring at her. As soon as the noise of the laughter fades away, Jesus resumes speaking as if the apparition of the woman had kindled the flame of the sermon, which was losing intensity in his conclusion and no longer looks at her. He looks instead at his audience, who seem embarrassed and scandalised at the event. Jesus says, I told you to be faithful to the law. To be humble and merciful. To love not only your brothers by the flesh, but also those who are brothers because they were born like you, of man. I told you that forgiveness is better than hospitality. That compassion is better than stubbornness. But now I tell you, that you must not condemn unless you are free from the fault you wish to condemn. Do not behave like the scribes and Pharisees who are severe with everybody except themselves, who call impure what is exterior and can only contaminate what is exterior and then they receive impurity in the very depths of their hearts. God does not stay with the impure because impurity corrupts what is the property of God. Souls, and in particular, the souls of children who are angels spread over the earth. 
Woe to those who tear off their wings with the cruelty of devilish beasts and throw those flowers of heaven into the mire by letting them taste the flavor of material things. Woe! It would be better if they died struck by thunderbolt rather than commit such sin. Woe to you, rich and fast living people, because it is amongst you that the greatest impurity thrives and idleness and money are its bed and pillar. You are now sated. The food of concupiscence reaches your throats and chokes you. But you will be hungry. And your hunger will be terrible, insatiable, and unappeasable forever and ever. You are now rich. How much good you could do with your wealth. Instead, you do so much harm both to yourselves and to other people. But you will experience a dreadful poverty on a day that will have no end. You now laugh. You think you are triumphing. But your tears will fill the ponds of Gehenna, and they will never cease. Where does adultery nest? Where does the corruption of young girls hide? Who has two or three licentious beds in addition to his own matrimonial one? on which he squanders his money and wastes the strength of a healthy body given to him by God, that he may work for his family and not to wear himself out through filthy unions which place him below unclean beasts. You heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, that he who looks at a woman lustfully, that she who wishes to go with a man has already committed adultery in his or her heart. Simply by that. There is no reason which can justify fornication. None. Neither the abandonment nor the repudiation of a husband, nor pity for the repudiated woman. You have one soul only. When it is joined to another soul by a pact of faithfulness, it must not lie. Otherwise, the beautiful body for which you sin will go with you. O oh, impure souls, into the inexhausted fire. Mutilate your body rather than kill it forever by damning it. Come to your moral senses, O oh, rich men. Verminous sinks of vice, so that you may not disgust heaven. Mary, who at the beginning listened with a face which was a dream of allurement and irony, sneering now and again, at the end of the sermon becomes livid with rage. She realises that although Jesus does not look at her, he is speaking to her. She becomes more and more livid and rebellious, and at last can resist no longer. She spitefully envelops herself in her veil and followed by the glances of the crowds jeering at her and by Jesus' voice which pursues her. 
she runs down the slope of the mountain, leaving strips of her dress on the thistles and dog rose bushes growing on the edges of the path, laughing out of anger and mockery. I see nothing else, but Jesus says, you will see more. 29th of May, 1945. Jesus resumes. You are indignant at what happened. For two days, our shelter, which is well above the muck, has been upset by Satan's hiss. It is therefore no longer a shelter, and we will leave it. But I wish to conclude this code of the most perfect in this wide and bright horizon. God really appears here in the majesty of the Creator, and watching his marvels, we can firmly believe that he and not Satan is the master. The evil one could not create even a blade of grass. But God can do everything. This should comfort us. But you are already in the sun, and that is harmful. Spread out on the slopes where there is shade and it is cool. Have your meals if you wish so. I will speak to you again on the same subject. Many things have delayed us, but do not be sorry about it. You are with God here. The crowd shout. Yes, we are with you. And they move under the thicket spread on the eastern side, so that the slope of the hill and the tree branches shelter them from the sun, which is already too warm. In the meantime, Jesus tells Peter to take the tent down. Are we really going away? Yes, we are. Because she came? Yes, but do not tell anybody, especially the zealot. He would be upset because of Lazarus. I cannot allow the word of God to be mocked at by heathens. I see, I see. Well, there is another thing you must understand. Which, master? That it is necessary to be silent in certain cases. Please, do not forget. You are so dear, but you are also very impulsive as to burst out into biting criticism. I understand. You do not want for Lazarus and Simon, and for the others as well. Do you think that there will be any today? Today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, always. It will always be necessary to watch the rashness of my Simon of Jonah. Go now and do what I told you. Peter goes away, calling his companions to help him. This carrot is pensive in a corner. Jesus calls him three times, but he does not hear. At last he turns round. Do you want me, master? He asks. Yes, go and take your food and help your companions. I am not hungry, neither are you. Neither am I, but for different reasons. Are you upset, Judas? No, master, I am tired. We are now going to the lake and then to Judea, Judas, to your mother's, as I promised you. Judas cheers up. Are you really coming only with me? Of course. Love me, Judas. I would like my love to be such in you as to preserve you from all evil. Master, I am a man. I am not an angel. At times I feel tired. Is it the sin to feel the need of sleep? No, 
providing you sleep on my chest. Look over there, how happy the people are, and how beautiful the scenery is from here. Also, Judea must be lovely in springtime. Most beautiful, master, but spring there on the mountains which are higher than here is later. But there are beautiful flowers. The apple orchards are magnificent. Mine, which is looked after by my mother, is one of the most beautiful ones. And when she moves about in it, with the doves following her to get some corn, believe me, it is a sight that soothes your heart. I believe you. If my mother is not too tired, I would like to take her to see yours. They would love each other, because they are both good. Judas, drawn by this idea, cheers up and forgetting that he was not hungry and he was tired, runs happily to his companions, and tall as he is, he undoes the topmost knots without any trouble, and eats his bread and olives, as happy as a child. Jesus looks at him pitifully, and then goes towards the apostles. Here is some bread, master, and an egg. I got that rich man over there, the one wearing the red tunic, to give it me. I said to him, you listen, and you are hungry. He speaks, and he's exhausted. Give me one of your eggs. It will do him much more good than it will do you. Peter, no, Lord, you are as pale as a baby sucking from an empty breast, and you are becoming as thin. Thin as a fish after the mating season. Let me see to it. I do not want to have to reproach myself. I will put it under these warm ashes of the faggots I burn, and you will eat it. Don't you know it is... How many? Most certainly weeks that we have been feeding on bread and olives and a little milk. <laughs> mm. One could say that we are purging ourselves. And you eat less than everybody and speak for everybody. Here is the egg. Take it while it's warm. It will do you good. Jesus obeys, and seeing that Peter is eating bread only, he asks. And what about you? Where are your olives? Shh, shh, shh. I need them for after. I promised them. To whom? To some children. But... If they are not quiet until the end, I will eat the olives and give them the stones. That is blows. Very good indeed. Ay, I will never do that. But if we don't say so, I got so many blows myself. And if they have given me all the ones I deserve for all my pranks, I should have had ten times as many. But they do you good. I am like this because I got them. They all laugh at the Apostle's sincerity. Master, I would like to remind you that today is Friday and that these people, I do not know whether they will be able to get food in time for tomorrow or reach their homes, says Bartholomew. That's true, it's Friday, several of them say. It does not matter. God will provide. But we will tell them. Jesus stands up and goes to his new place, in the middle of the crowd, spread in the thicket. First of all, I wish to remind you that this is Friday. I say that those who are afraid, they cannot reach their homes in time and are not in a position to believe that God will provide food for his children tomorrow, should go away at once, so that they will not be still on the road at sunset. Of all the crowds there, about fifty people get up, all the others stay where they are. Jesus smiles and begins to speak. You heard that in the old days it was said, you shall not commit adultery. 
Those who among you have heard me in other places know that I have spoken about that sin several times. Because, look, as far as I am concerned, it is a sin not for one person only, but for two or for three. I will make myself clear. An adulterer sins with regard to himself. He sins with regard to his accomplice and sins, causing the betrayed wife or husband to sin. They may in fact be led to despair or to commit to crime. That with regard to the accomplished sin. But I will say more. I say not only the accomplished sin, but the desire to accomplish it is already a sin. What is adultery? It is to crave for him who is not ours, or for her who is not ours. One begins to sin by wishing, continues by seduction, completes it by persuasion, crowns it, by the deed. How does one begin? Generally with an impure glance. And that is connected with what I said before. An impure eye sees what is concealed from a pure eye. And through the eye, thirst enters the throat. Hunger enters the body and fever the blood. A carnal thirst, hunger and fever. Delirium begins. If the person looked at is honest, the delirious looker on is left alone on tenter hooks or will denigrate in revenge. If also the person looked at is dishonest, he will reply to the look and the descent into sin begins. I therefore say to you, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he has already committed adultery with her because his thought has accomplished the deed of its desire. If your right eye should cause you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to be without one eye than to be thrown into the infernal darkness forever. And if your right hand should cause you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away. For it will do you less harm to lose one part of you than to have your whole body go to hell. It is true that it is written that deformed people cannot serve God in the temple. But after this life, the deformed by birth who are holy and those who are deformed out of virtue will become more beautiful than angels and will serve God, loving him in the happiness of heaven. It has also been said unto you, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a writ of dismissal. But that is to be condemned, for it does not come from God. God said to Adam, This is the helpmate I made for you. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and conquer it. And Adam, full of superior intelligence, because sin had not yet dimmed his reason made perfect by God 
exclaimed, This at last is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. This is to be called woman. That is another I, because this was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and joins himself to his wife and the two become one body. And an, an increased splendor of light, the eternal light approved, smiling at Adam's word, which became the first indelible law. Now, if owing to the ever-increasing hardness of man, the human lawgiver had to give a new law. If owing to the ever-increasing inconstancy of man, the lawgiver had to put a restraint and say, If you have dismissed her, you cannot take her back. That does not cancel the first genuine law passed by the earthly paradise and approved by God. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for the case of fornication, exposes her to adultery. Because what will the divorced woman do? In 90% of the cases, she will get married again. With what consequences? Oh, how much there is to be said about that. How many tears are shed because of lust? Yes, lust. There is no other name for it. Be frank. Everything can be overcome when the spirit is righteous. But everything is an excuse to satisfy sensuality when the spirit is lustful. Woman's frigidity, dullness, ineptitude for housework, shrewish tongue, love for luxury, everything can be overcome. Also diseases and irascibility if one loves holily. But as after some time, one does not love as on the first day. What is more than possible is considered impossible. And a poor woman is thrown onto the road and to perdition. He who rejects her commits adultery. He who marries her after the divorce commits adultery. Death only dissolves a marriage. Remember that. And if your choice is an unhappy one, bear the consequences as a cross, being both of you unhappy but holy, without making also the children unhappy, as they are innocent and suffer more because of such unfortunate situations. The love for your children should cause you to ponder 100 times. Also in the case of death of your partner. Oh, I wish you could be satisfied with what you already have had and to which God said enough. I wish you, widows and widowers, Realize that death is not an attenuation, but an elevation to the perfections of parents. To be a mother in the place of a dead mother. To be a father in the place of a deceased father. To be two souls in one and receive the love for the children from the cold lips of the dying partner and say, go in peace without worrying for those who were born of you. I will continue to love them on my own 
and on your behalf. I will love them twice and will be their father and mother and they will not suffer the unhappiness of orphans. Neither will they feel the inborn jealousy that the children of a remarried consort experience with regard to him or her who takes the sacred place of mother or father called by God to a new abode. My children, my sermon is drawing to its end. As the day is nearing its end, while the sun is setting in the west. I want you to remember the words of this meeting on the mountain. Engrave them in your hearts. Read them over and over again and very often. Let them be your everlasting guidance. And above all, be good to those who are weak. Do not judge that you may not be judged. Remember that the moment might come when God could remind you. That is how you judged. So you knew that that was bad. You therefore committed a sin knowing what you were doing. You must now pay for it. Charity is an absolution. Be charitable to everybody and in everything. If God gives you much assistance to keep you good, do not be proud of it. But endeavour to climb the full length of the ladder of perfection and give a hand to those who are tired or unaware and to those who are easily disappointed. Why do you observe so diligently the splinter in your brother's eye? If first you do not go to the trouble of taking the plank out of your own eye. How dare you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, while the plank in your eye is blinding you. Son, do not be a hypocrite. Take the plank out of your own eye first and then you will be able to take the splinter out of your brother's eye without ruining him. As you avoid being uncharitable, avoid also being imprudent. I said to you, give a hand to those who are tired or unaware and to those who are easily disappointed. But if it is charity to teach the ignorant, to encourage the tired, to give new wings to those whose old ones are broken, it is imprudence to reveal the eternal truths to those affected by Satanism who take possession of them to pretend they are prophets, to insinuate themselves among simple people, to corrupt, lead astray, and sacrilegiously foul the things of God. Absolute respect to be able to speak, to be silent, to ponder, to act, are the virtues of the true disciple in order to make proselytes and serve God. You are gifted with the faculty of reason and if you are just, God will grant you all the light to make a better use of your reason. You must consider that the eternal truths are like pearl and no one has ever seen pearls thrown in front of pigs which prefer acorns and rank broth to precious pearls which they could crush under their feet and then furious at being mocked at they would turn against you to tear you to pieces do 
not give dogs what is holy. That is for the present and the future. I have told you much, my children. Listen to my words. He who listens to them and puts them into practice can be compared to a thoughtful man who, wishing to build a house, chose a rocky place. He certainly worked hard to lay the foundations. He had to work with pick and stone chisel. He got callous hands and broke his back. But he was able to put lime in the fissures of the rock and lay bricks one close to the other, like the wall of a fortress and the house was as solid as a mountain. The house was exposed to the inclemency of the weather and to downpours. The rain caused the rivers to overflow their banks. The winds whistled. The waves beat it. But the house resisted everything. Such is he who has a sound faith. Instead, who listens superficially and does not strive to engrave my words in his heart because he is aware that to do so he would have to work hard, suffer and extirpate too many things, is like a man who out of indolence and foolishness builds his house on sand. As soon as the inclement weather comes, the house quickly built, quickly collapses, and the forlorn fool contemplates the rubble of the house and the ruin of his capital. And in that case, the ruin can be repaired with expenses and work. But if the edifice of the spirit crashes, because it was badly built, there is no way to rebuild it. One cannot build in future life. Woe to those who present themselves there with rubble. I have finished. I am now going down towards the lake. And I bless you in the name of the one and trine God. May peace be with you. But the crowds shout, We're coming with you! Let us come! No one has words like yours! And they begin to follow Jesus, who goes down on the opposite side from which he came up, and which is in the direction of Capernaum. The descent is steeper, but fast, and they soon reach the foot of the mountain on a green, flowery plain. Jesus says, enough for today, tomorrow. The Poem of the Man-God The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 175 The Leper Cured at the Foot of the Mountain 30th of May, 1945 Amongst the many flowers which perfume the earth and delight our eyes, I see the horrible spectre of a revolting, corroded leper, completely covered with sores. The crowd shout with fear and rush back to the lower slopes of the mountain. Some of them gather stones to throw at the rash man. But Jesus turns round with his arms fully stretched out and shouts, Peace! Stay where you are! Be not afraid! Put the stones down! Have mercy on a poor brother! He is a son of God too! The crowds obey, overwhelmed by the power of the master, who moves forward through the tall grass and bloom to a few steps from the leper, who on his part has understood that Jesus is protecting him and has come nearer. When he reaches Jesus, 
he prostrates himself, and the blooming grass envelops him like a cool, scented water. The flowers undulate and gather together, forming a veil over the miserable man concealed amongst them. Only the mournful voice that can be heard reminds people of the wretched creature lying there. It says, Lord, if you want, you can cure me. Have mercy also on me. Jesus replies, Raise your head and look at me. A man who believes in heaven must be able to look at it. And you do believe, because you are asking for a grace. The grass is shaken and opens out once again, like the head of a shipwrecked person emerging from the sea. The head of the leper appears, stripped of hair and beard. His head is a skull, not yet entirely deprived of all flesh. And yet Jesus does not disdain touching that forehead with the tips of his fingers, where there are no sores on the skin. But the skin on that spot is ashen grey, scaly, and lies between two putrid erosions, one of which has destroyed his scalp, and the other has opened a hole where his right eye was, so that I could not say whether the ball of his eye is still in the huge socket, which between his temple and his nose lays bare his cheekbone and his nasal cartilage, full of corruption. And Jesus, holding the fingertips of his lovely hand there, says, I want it. Be cleansed. And as if the man were not eaten away and covered with sores, but only covered with dirt on which cleansing waters were poured, the leprosy disappears at once. First the wounds heal, then his skin becomes clear, his right eye appears between fresh eyelids. His lips close round his yellowish teeth. Only his hair and beard are missing. That is, there are only scanty tufts of hair where previously there was only a tiny piece of wholesome skin. The crowds shout in amazement and their joyful shouts tell the man that he is cured. He lifts his hand so far concealed by the grass. He touches his eye, where the huge hole was. He touches his head, where the large saw showed the skull, and feels his fresh skin. He stands up, looks at his chest, his hips. He is all wholesome and clean. He collapses once again on the flowery meadow, weeping out of joy. Do not weep. Stand up and listen to me. Go back to life according to the right and do not tell anybody until you have accomplished it. Show yourself to the priest as soon as possible. Make the offering prescribed by Moses as evidence of your miraculous cure. It is for you that I should witness, my lord. You will witness for me by loving my doctrine. Go. The crowd has come close once again, and they congratulate the man miraculously healed, although from due distance. There are some people who feel they ought to give him some provisions for his journey and throw some coins to him. Others throw bread and foodstuffs, and a man seeing that the leopard's clothes are nothing but torn rags, through which his entire body is visible, takes his mantle off, ties it in a knot as if it were a large handkerchief, and throws it to the leper, who can thus cover himself decently. Another man, as charity is contagious when it is in common, cannot resist his desire to supply him with sandals, takes off his own and throws them to the leper. And what about you? asks Jesus, who saw the gesture. Oh, I live nearby. I can walk barefooted. 
he has to go a long way. May God bless you and all those who have helped our brother. Man, you will pray for them. Yes, I will. I will pray for them and for you, that the world may have faith in you. Goodbye. Go in peace. The man walks away a few yards, then turns round and shouts, Can I tell the priest that you have cured me? It is not necessary. Just say, the Lord had mercy on me. It is the whole truth and nothing else is required. The people throng around the master, forming a circle which does not want to open at any cost. But the sun has set and the Sabbath rest begins. The villagers are far away. But the people do not pine for their villages, their food or anything else. But the apostles are worried about it and they tell Jesus. Also the elder disciples are worried. There are women and children and while the night is mild and the grass for the meadow is soft, the stars are not bred, neither do stones become food. Jesus is the only one who does not trouble. The people in the meantime eat the remnants of their food without any worry, and Jesus points it out to his disciples. I solemnly tell you that these people are worth more than you are. Look how thoughtlessly they are finishing everything. I said to them, who cannot believe that God will provide food for his children tomorrow, may go away. And they stayed. God will not belie his Messiah and will not disappoint those who hope in him. The apostles shrug their shoulders and do not show concern for anything else. It is nightfall after a placid, beautiful red sunset and the silence of the country spreads over everything after the last choir of birds. There is a light whispering of the wind and then the first mute flight of a night bird. The first star appears and the frog croaks. The children are already asleep. The adults are talking among themselves and now and again someone goes to the master asking for clarification of some point or other. So no one is surprised when a person, imposing by look, garments and age, is seen coming along a path between two cornfields. Some men are following him. Everybody turns round to look at him, and they point him out to one another, whispering. The whispering spreads from one group to another. It revives and fades away. The groups that are farther away come near, drawn by curiosity. The noble-looking man reaches Jesus who is sat at the foot of a tree listening to some men, and bows down before him. Jesus stands up at once and responds with equal respect to the salutation. The people present are watching attentively. I was up on the mountain, and perhaps you thought that I did not have faith as I went away for fear of having to fast. But I went away for another reason. I wanted to be a brother among brothers, the eldest brother. I would like to speak to you, Asai. Can you listen to me? Although a scribe, I am not your enemy. Let us move away a little. And they go into the cornfield. I wanted to provide some food for the pilgrims, and I came down to tell the baker to bake bread for a large crowd. You can see that I am at a legal distance because these fields belong to me and it is lawful to walk from here to the top on a Sabbath. It was my intention to come up tomorrow with my servants but I found out that you are here with the crowd. I beg you to allow me to provide for the Sabbath. Otherwise I would be very sorry that I had to forego your words for nothing. For nothing, no, never. 
because the Father would have compensated you with his light. But I thank you and will not disappoint you. I only wish to point out that the crowd is very large. I asked them to heat all the ovens, also the ones used to dry foodstuffs, and I will succeed in having bread for everybody. I did not mean that. I was referring to the quantity of bread. That does not trouble me. Last year, I had a good crop of corn. You have seen what the ears of corn are like this year. Let me do it. It will be the greatest protection for my fields. After all, Master, you gave me such bread today. You really are the bread of the Spirit. Let it be done as you wish. Let us go and tell the pilgrims. No, you said so. Are you a scribe? Yes, I am. May the Lord take you where your heart deserves. I understand what you mean, but do not say. You mean to the truth, because great are our errors and our ill will. Who are you? A son of God. Pray the Father for me. Goodbye. Peace be with you. Jesus goes slowly back to his disciples while the man goes away with his servants. Who was he? What did he want? Did he say something unpleasant to you? Has he sick people? Jesus is assailed with questions. I do not know who he is, or rather, I know that he is good-hearted and that he is John the scribe, says one of the crowd. Well, I know now because you said so. He only wanted to be the servant of God with his children. Pray for him, because tomorrow we shall all have food, thanks to his goodness. He really is a just man, says one. Yes, indeed. I do not know how he can be the friend of the others, remarks another one. He is swathed in scruples and rules like a baby, but he's not a bad man, concludes a third one. Do these fields belong to him? Ask many who are not from this part of the country. Yes, they do. I think that the leper was one of his servants or peasants, but he allowed him to stay around here, and I think that he also fed him. The comments continue, but Jesus does not pay attention to them. He calls the twelve near him and asks them. And what should I say now in regard to your incredulity? Did the Father not put bread for all of us into the hands of one who by caste is an enemy of mine? O oh, men of little faith, go into the soft hay and sleep. I am going to pray the Father that he may open your hearts and to thank him for his kindness. Peace be with you and he goes to the lower slopes of the mountain. He sits down and collects his thoughts in prayer. When he raises his eyes, he sees the myriad of stars crowding the sky. When he lowers them, he sees the crowd of people sleeping on the meadows. Nothing else. But such is the joy in his heart that his face seems to become transfigured by a bright, The Poem of the Man God, The Second Year of the Public Life Chapter 176 The Sabbath After the Sermon At the Foot of the Mountain 1st of June, 1945 Jesus has delayed somewhat up on the mountain during the night, so that at dawn he can be seen standing on the edge of an escarpment. Peter, who sees him, 
points him out to his companions and they go up towards him. Master, why did you not come with us? Many of them ask. I needed to pray. But you also need to rest very badly. My friends, during the night a voice came from heaven, asking for prayers for the good and the wicked, and also for myself. Why do you need it as much as anybody? My strength is nourished with prayer and my joy with doing what my father wants. My father told me the names of two people and a sorrow for myself. The three things he mentioned need prayer so much. Jesus is very sad and he looks at his apostles with eyes which seem to be begging or asking for something. His eyes rest on one, then on another, and at last on Judas Iscariot, and Jesus stares at him. The apostle notices it and asks, Why do you look at me like that? I was not looking at you. My eyes were contemplating something else. That is the nature of a disciple. All the good and all the evil that a disciple can do and give to his master. I was thinking of the disciple of the prophets and of John, and I was thinking of my own. And I was praying for John, for the disciples and for myself. You are sad and tired this morning, master. Tell those who love you what your trouble is, begs James of Zebedee. Yes, tell us, and if there is anything we can do to relieve your grief, we will do it, says his cousin Judas. Peter speaks to Bartholomew and Philip, but I do not understand what they say. Jesus replies, Be good, and even to be good and faithful. That is the only relief. There is no other one, Peter. Have you understood? Forget your suspicion. Love me and love one another. Do not allow those who hate me to seduce you. Above all, love the will of God. Hey, if everything is within its control, also our errors are within it exclaims Thomas in a philosophical tone. Do you think so? But it is not so. But many people have woken up and are looking here. Let us go down and sanctify this holy day with the word of God. They go down while the people who wake up are more and more numerous. The children, as merry as little sparrows, are already prattling, running and jumping in the meadows, getting wet with dew, so that a few blows begin to fly with consequent tears. Then the children run towards Jesus, who caresses them and begins to smile once again, as if he reflected their innocent cheerfulness. A little girl wants to put a little bunch of flowers on his belt, flowers she picked in the meadow. Because his tunic is more beautiful like that, she says, and Jesus lets her do it although the apostles grumble. But Jesus says, You ought to be happy that they love me. The dew removes the dust from the flowers. The love of children removes all sadness from my heart. Jesus, coming from the mountain, arrives in the midst of the pilgrims at the same time as John the scribe, who is coming from his house with many servants, carrying baskets of bread, olives, cheese, and a little lamb or a little kid, whatever it may be, roasted for the master. Everything is laid at his feet, and he sees to the distribution, giving everybody some bread, a slice of cheese, and a handful of olives. But he gives a piece of the roasted lamb with bread to a mother, who is still holding at her breast a plump baby, who laughs, showing his milk teeth. And he does likewise with two or three more people, whom he thinks need special attention. 
But it is for you, master, says the scribe. I will have some, do not worry. But see, if I know that many partake of your goodness, it will taste better to me. The distribution is over, and the people nibble at their bread, leaving some for later. Jesus also drinks the milk which the scribe wishes to pour for him into a precious cup from a little flask held by a servant and which looks like a little pitcher. But you must satisfy me and give me the joy of hearing you, says John the scribe, who is greeted by Hermas with equal respect and with greater respect by Stephen. I will not deny you that satisfaction. Come over here. And Jesus leans against the mountain and begins to speak. God's will has held us in this place because we had gone any further. After the distance we had walked, we would have infringed the precepts and caused scandal. And may that never happen until the new pact is written. It is right to sanctify feast days and praise the Lord in places of prayer. But the whole creation can be a place of prayer. If man can make it thus, through his elevation to the Father. Noah's ark adrift on the water was a place of prayer and likewise the belly of Jonah's whale. Places of prayer were the house of the Pharaoh when Joseph lived in it and the tent of hollow ferns for the chaste Judith. And was not the corrupt place where the prophet Daniel lived as a slave, so sacred to the Lord because of the holiness of his servant who sanctified the place as to deserve the high prophecies of Christ and of the Antichrist, which are a key to present and future times? All the more reason this place is holy, as with its hues and scents, with its pure air and rich crops, with its dewy pearls, it speaks to us of God, the Father and Creator, and says, I believe, and you ought to believe, because we bear witness to God. Let it therefore be our synagogue for this Sabbath, and let us read the eternal pages on corollas and ears, with the sun as our lamp. I mentioned Daniel. I said to you, let this place be our synagogue. That reminds us of the joyful, bless the Lord, of the three holy young men in the flames of the furnace. Heavens and waters, dew and frost, ice and snow, fire and colours, light and darkness, lightning and clouds, mountains and hills, all germinated things, birds, fish and animals. Praise and bless the Lord with humble, holy-hearted men. We can pray and deserve heaven everywhere. We deserve it when we do the Father's will. At daybreak, they pointed out to me that if everything is controlled by the will of God, also the errors of men are wanted by that will. That is an error and a widespread one. Can a father ever wish his son to be blameworthy? No, he cannot. And yet we see that in some families, some sons become blameworthy, although they have a just father who points out to them the good to be done, and the evil to be avoided. And no righteous person will accuse a father of urging his sons to do evil things. God is the father. Men are the sons. 
God points out the good and says, Behold, I put you in this situation for your own good. Also, when the evil one and the men who serve him bring misfortunes to men, God says, Behold, this is how you must behave in this painful hour. By doing so, this misfortune will serve for an eternal good. He advises you, but does not force you. So if a man, knowing what the will of God is, prefers to do the very opposite, can we say that this very opposite is the will of God? We cannot. Love God's will. Love it more than your own and follow it against the enticements and power of the world, of the flesh, of the demon. Also, those things have a will. But I solemnly tell you that he who submits to such wills is most unhappy. You call me Messiah and Lord. You say you love me and you praise me. You follow me, and that seems love. But I solemnly tell you that not everyone amongst you will enter the kingdom of heaven with me. Also amongst my earliest and latest disciples, there are some who will not enter the kingdom. Because many will do their own will, or the will of the flesh, of the world, of the demon, but not my father's. Not those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my father, they will be the ones, the only ones, to enter the kingdom of God. The day will come when I who am now speaking to you, after being the shepherd, will be the judge. Do not let the present appearance deceive you. Now my shepherd's staff gathers together all the scattered souls and kindly invites you to come to the pastures of truth. Later, the staff will be replaced by the scepter of the judge king, and my power will be quite different. It will not be the kindness, but with the implacable justice that I will separate the sheep fed with truth from those which mixed truth and error or fed only on error. I will do that a first time and then once again. And woe betide those who between the first and the second appearance before the judge will not have purged themselves because they will not be able to purge themselves of their poisons. The third category will not purge itself. No pain can purge it. They wanted nothing but error, so let them be in error. But yet among them there will be someone moaning. What, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name did we not cast out demons and work many miracles? And then I will say very clearly to them. Yes, you dared to clothe yourselves with my name that you might appear what you are not. You wanted your Satanism to be considered as living with Jesus, but you are accused by the fruit of your deeds. Where are the souls you saved? When were your prophecies fulfilled? What was the result of your exorcisms? Who was the accomplice? of your deviations. Oh, my enemy is really powerful, 
but not more than I am. He helped you only to plunder more souls, and thanks to you, the circle of those swept away by heresy has widened. Yes, you have worked wonders, which apparently looked even greater than those of the true servants of God, who are not histrionics who astonish crowds, but are so humble and obedient as to amaze angels. My true servants, through their sacrifices, do not create phantasms but wipe them out of hearts. They do not impose themselves on men, but show God to souls of men. They do nothing but the will of the Father and lead others to do it, like a wave that pushes the wave preceding it and draws the one following it, without putting themselves on a throne and saying, Look, my true servants do what I tell them without thinking of anything else, and their deeds bear the sign of my unmistakable peace, kindness, and order. I can therefore say to you, they are my servants. But I do not know you. Go away from me, all of you, workers of iniquity. That is what I will say. And it will be a dreadful word. Take care. You do not deserve it. And proceed along the safe, although painful way of obedience towards the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Enjoy your Sabbath rest, praising God with your whole selves. Peace be with you. And Jesus blesses the crowds before they scatter, seeking shade. One group speaking to another, commenting on the words they have just heard. Jesus is left with his apostles, John the scribe who does not speak, but is absorbed in deep meditation, watching every gesture of Jesus. And the cycle of the mount is over.